Hi, everybody. Lots of greetings and uh, meeting long lost friends. I think the IGF is that space. Uh, but we have some more sobering business to deal with this afternoon. Um, but of course, uh, like everything that is political and has an opportunity in the horizon, we will deal with it with the sincerity that it requires. So uh, welcome to this event organized by the Global Digital Justice Forum and IT for Change. Uh, just to set the context, and more people are coming in, so please do take the seats around the square table or the round table. Uh, what I would like to do is to just make a few initial remarks uh, before we start with uh, our exciting panelists. Uh, I want to quote the UN Secretary General and uh, the characterization by the Secretary General of how we are coping with not just the digital divide, but an unfolding data epoch, and we are also besieged by a development divide. We also know that the gains of connectivity are skewed, and at some point we thought that the access debate was over, but it isn't yet. And in an era of digital infrastructures and public goods, we are all the more confronted by this question of uh, the access and connectivity divide. We also know that a few transnational corporations are able to embrace the digital revolution. In the previous session in this room, we heard references to how in certain parts of the world, the cloud infrastructure used by governments is actually somewhat beholden to corporations from that are transnational corporations. So the inequality of the digital economy presents uh, urgent challenges, and these are not just challenges uh, for those who are already connected, but these are also challenges for those who may not ever be connected, but whose lives will be uh, indelibly impacted by the digital revolution. So the actions we need to take are about the democratization of benefits of digitalization, the governance of digital resources, and to make digital policies that can catalyze innovation that counts. Because very often in a world of patent thickets and uh, sleeping patents and all of that, we see that innovation is often held hostage to the way in which intellectual property operates um, in the digital space. So the ultimate test, I think, is the public and social value that uh, digitalization can create and the human freedoms that it can expand. So if we can do just these two things well, we would have done it. And the Global Digital Compact is one such opportunity. And I think that we do need to carry the consensus that's possible to build around the Global Digital Compact forward. But of course, it's not easy to build consensus. There are people around the table whose business it has been to build consensus all their lives. So we really count on their experience, um, both civil society uh, and from the UN system, you know, trying to really uh, galvanize the voices that can hold um, the bottom line. Uh, I think this session is organized because we want to listen very carefully to the devil in the detail. So we need to locate and listen carefully to the devil in the detail, the voices that are seemingly saying the same thing, but actually coming from extremely different standpoints. You know, words like trust, which were, you know, discussed uh, in the last session, very, very beautifully, very evocatively. But we do not make, mean the same thing when we say freedoms, when we say trust, when we say openness. We all mean different things, and so it's very important to start there from these imaginaries, but then go closer to the norms, ethics, and pathways of dig digitalization. Of course, um, you know, when the WISIS happened, and I had the privilege to be in those spaces uh, to actually watch, listen, and learn. It seemed like human rights were really very important to protect. They continue to be important, but in the context of structural injustices in the world, we also think there are emerging anxieties around the geoeconomics of data and AI. And the question of, are our institutions ready? Are they anachronistic? Can they mediate social justice? Uh, so we are at a very critical juncture. The session actually is a series of questions, and it's in a very interesting format that I was part of uh, some time ago uh, in the University of Western Australia. It worked very well. It was for a, a thematic conference on tech crimes. So, you know, 
this was build it, break it, and fix it. So the first round, which is build it, will answer the question as to why is the UN Global Digital Compact critical to address the gaps in digital cooperation? What is its promise? The second round is the break it round, where we have to get real. We have to really look at this proposition and see if we can at all build it. So the second round will be a set of propositions that are um, really where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. What are the gaps in the UN Global Digital Compact? Is it really transformative? Is digital justice even possible in this world? You know, we are talking about uh, you know, the uh, uh, climate transition and the challenges confronting us, and similarly, the digital transition. And the final fix-it round has, um, it's a moment of pause. Step back and say, you know, these are all people with vision, people with optimism, who will bring it together and say, how can we make the UN Digital Compact a powerful basis for a global democratic digital governance paradigm? How do we realize the spirit of the WSIS? I was discussing with Andrea this morning, and we agreed that there was this um, you know, agenda, the Geneva and Tunis agenda was very, very precious. It's important to keep it with all its flaws, because it does articulate the need for an inclusive, people-centered, development-oriented uh, information society. In the data and AI age, it didn't anticipate, but we may add. So without ado, I'd like to uh, suggest that this is the format. We will have five speakers per round. The first round is a build it round. Um, I know it's very hard for us to play to a certain uh, script, but try and keep to the building, the breaking, and the fixing, so that in that posturing, maybe we will actually be able to churn out uh, better sense, hopefully. And in this room, there is, I think, uh, all the intelligence um, that is needed. So I would like to invite Ambassador Amandeep uh, Singhil, who is um, the tech envoy uh, to the UN Secretary General, to build it. Thank you. I think you should use this Hello. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, and a very nice scene setting. Um, I love this idea of you know, you, I think with children you might have seen Thomas the Tank en Engine can be, uh, or Bob the Builder can be build it. Yes, we can. Um, and what are what are we building in the Global Digital Compact? Uh, we are building a shared vision, a global framework for digital governance that is negotiated by governments, but is open to participation by regional organizations, the private sector, and civil society. So the process has an intergovernmental bias, in a sense, with multi-stakeholder inputs. But then even the product that is open to multi-stakeholder commitments and participation. Um, and with this global framework, we are attempting to address some of the challenges that you mentioned. Uh, lowering the entry barriers to digital governance for more countries, more civil society participation, more uh, of the private sector beyond the usual suspects, beyond big tech to, to participate and then shape together. So there is that opportunity that we are trying to build we are also trying to build and shape a transition away from solutions orientation to ecosystems and infrastructures for digital development. And let me just pause here because I think this is very critical for digital justice. Um, if we just stay with the connectivity paradigm, that uh, all we need to do is bring the 2.6 to 2.7 billion who are unconnected online and good things will follow. All we need to do is look at specific problems and use digital technologies to solve those problems. We will have progress, no doubt about it. I mean, there's plenty of evidence out there what additional connectivity, especially broadband connectivity, does to economic growth, social participation. Uh, but we will not 
kind, get the kind of acceleration we need to cover that 85% deficit on the SDG. So 15% we are on target, 85% um, uh, of the goals and the targets within those goals we are not on target. So we need a big boost and that's not going to come from the same paradigm. So we, need, we are building a shift in paradigm, focusing more on digital public infrastructure that creates those inclusive innovation spaces, focusing more on capacity building, a networked approach to capacity building. As the SG put it in his policy brief, creating one million digital champions for the SDGs, a quarter million in Africa. Focusing more on data commons, where data flows, uh, data comes together to drive progress on the SDGs. Not just better measurement, of where we are, and that's critical. I mean, you can't be navigating blind in this. You need to know where you are, but also data for the SDGs, where data is used in a more transformative way to innovate for the SDGs. Uh, there is also this aspect of guiding, steering the digital transformation, which you, as you put it, you know, has to expand human freedoms and has to um, create that public uh, social value. And for that, uh, the policymakers need to feel that they are in charge of this digital transformation. Civil society needs to feel that they are not being left aside. They also have agency over how things are uh, shaping, shaping up. So we need to create those blueprints for digital transformation that help the policymakers and other actors in this space get more agency over the digital transformation. So those are some of the kind of paradigm shifting build elements. And most crucially, think if we look at the space where there are risks, uh, where there are harms, whether they are coming from traditional digital sources of those risks and harms or some of the emerging sources, uh, generative AI for instance, we need to put in place guardrails. We need to put in place effective mechanisms. Again, as the SG has suggested, a human rights advisory mechanism. More proactive in terms of how legislations are shaped, more proactive in terms of how public sector uh, interprets uh, the law, regulatory frameworks, and also the suggestions around regulators, e-safety, regulators capacity and how e-safety commissioners and others should get together regularly to exchange experience to <coughs> raise the bar on uh, accountability uh, and equally on data protection. So those kind of protection related, guardrails related areas um, are uh, essential in this you know, building exercise that we are up to. Lastly, I would just like to spend uh, a minute on artificial intelligence, which is really a test case for what we are building. If the architecture that uh, we are putting together, if these action areas alongside the commitments that we are putting together are not able to handle this uh, latest um, manifestation of digital innovation, then it's not working. Uh, so therefore, we need to make sure that apart from the different very important conversations that are going on, we, uh, the G7 Hiroshima process, uh, the GPE uh, discussions, the UK um, AI summit, that we make sure that all the other countries who are not participating in those conversations have a space where they can also shape how the governance of AI uh, happens. Uh, and for that, the Secretary General is creating an advisory body on AI, a multi-stakeholder, globally representative advisory body that will look at the emerging landscape of risks and opportunities that look at the current landscape of governance what are the gaps there? Is there a scientific consensus, almost IPCC-like, that we can build around the risks and, and challenges? Uh, and is there uh, some role in terms of, not just the UN role, but perhaps an institution, 
uh, networked institutional role for the international governance of AI. There is the industry space, codes of conduct, certification schemes, various self-regulatory approaches. Uh, there is the national regional regulatory space, the AI Act, the legislation that's in the parliament in Brazil and so on. But what's the kind of international level uh, orchestration that could be put in place? So that's an important building block in the collective build-out exercise that I have attempted to uh, sketch out. And let me just conclude by saying that this cannot be the task of only the UN Secretariat, uh, cannot be the task only of member states, although they'll have to play the reading, leading role. This uh, building exercise has to be truly multi-stakeholder. All stakeholders have to participate. We have to co-create this together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, if I might just break the order of build it, break it, fix it, because you have very limited time and a lot of people might just want to ask you questions. Uh, I gather you have to leave in about 20 minutes, is that right? So since we have the pleasure of your company here, uh, and if there are questions uh, to the ambassador, uh, we could probably take uh, three questions. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Wolfgang Kleinwächter. I'm a retired professor from the University of Aarhus. And I, I'm really impressed uh, by your approach that you said, you know, we have to go beyond connectivity. And uh, I think the internet was always an enabling environment. And the uh, focus should be of enabling individuals, enabling small and medium enterprises. So I think to create an environment where we can really uh, bring the, the activities from the ground in the tradition <laughs> of the bottom-up processes uh, to the forefront. So I think this is really an important shift so that we go be beyond this, just you know, count how many people are on the internet. And so it's not enough. And the education, skills, all these are, I think, key issues which has to bring on the forefront and it has to be based on human rights declaration and the UN Carter. I think this is a good, good uh, approach. I have uh, concrete questions or some uh, problems with the procedure, how to develop the Global Digital Compact. You said in your introduction that it's mainly an intergovernmental process with multi-stakeholder involvement. So the question is how? So, uh, and uh, we had experience in the Tunis negotiations where the question was, you know, have non-state actors access to the negotiation rooms, have the right to speak, can they present proposals, comment on several articles, and, and things like that. So, and for me, this is st still unclear because the experiences from the deep dive consultations uh, are that we had, everybody could say everything, but there was not the impression that the input from non-state actors have really an impact on the governmental reactions. And so we have to have some uh, safe procedures in place which would guarantee that the input, which is so welcome when you, you know, from you, when you always say the multi-stakeholder has to be on the forefront, but you know, how you can make sure that this impact has really an input. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there, there's one online and one more. So uh, sh le let me go online first. Uh, can you unmute and speak, Nandini? Uh, hello, I hope you are able to hear me. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, Mike, uh, I'm Nandini from uh, IT for Change. And uh, my question is, uh, how can the Global Digital Compact uh, address the gaps that have been identified in the implementation of the business outcomes over the years? And how do we see what is coming out of it, linking with the business review, especially in terms of the enhanced cooperation agenda and, uh, you know, the related issues? Yeah, I will be very brief because I will have time to uh, speak about this in the third part of the section. So I'm Luca Belli, I'm professor at FGV Law School. 
And so my question is uh, with regard to the implementation. So we have, I already had a very good discussion with Amandeep about this some months ago. And I keep on having this curiosity about how this in de facto will be implemented. And uh, let me explain my point. I think that something that emerged uh, in a very uh, eloquent and telling way from the experience of the past 20 years, also, also the implementation of the WISIS uh, on the Tunis agenda and all the commitment, is that sometimes what is put into paper in the, in the product of a summit or a process then uh, does not correspond to the reality of the implementation. And uh, if we take the definition of internet governance where all the stakeholders join hand and uh, collectively define principles, room, nor rules, norms, and procedure, it sounds fantastic, but then we don't consider it in practice there might be some stakeholders whose enormous economic or political interest is sabotage of this joining hand and collectively defining norms, procedures, and rules. So what is the, is there, uh, my question is, is there any thinking about how to, to, to create guardrails and safeguards also uh, with regard to the potential, I don't want to call them bad faith actors, but actors that are not interest interested in having a, a global digital compact, and actually they have a huge economic or political interest in the sabotage of this kind of initiative. Thank you. Thank you, very, very thoughtful questions to start with uh, Wolfgang's question about how do we ensure continued multi-stakeholder participation in the negotiations phase? Uh, so uh, I think one is what happens inside the room, and you're absolutely right, uh, having transparency, uh, having different stakeholders um, in the room somehow so that they can see what's going on and have having the opportunity to shape that as well, you know, whether you lobby governments, uh, your individual governments, uh, that governments of places you come from or others. That's important. Uh, equally important is the opportunity around the room, like intersessionally, for instance, for the co-facilitators uh, to sit down with different stakeholders, listen to them, and take their feedback on, you know, what do you think about this stuff? Just as the co-facilitators have been doing so far, on the, the, uh, their sum, sum, summing up, they sat down with different stakeholders, consulted them, uh, took their feedback. So we have to be creative and we have to be constantly inventive uh, to enlarge this space because the we are stuck with a structure that's intergovernmental by design. Uh, but we've succeeded uh, creatively with this forum, for instance, the IGF. And even there is a recent example, the negotiations around with the chemical industry uh, that our colleagues at UNEP uh, facilitated. So they found some creative ways to engage with industry and to enhance their accountability, uh, to find a space between hard norms and self-regulation. That, that space uh, was uh, invented in a sense. So we'll have to keep doing that, and we will need your cooperation uh, so that uh, we can uh, have that dynamic inside the room and outside the room all through the process. The question um, that um, uh, Nandini asked about uh, the gaps that are there. So in the Secretary General's policy brief, you see a chart in which different forums are put there the IGF, and the VISIS Forum, CSTD, those are kind of, you know, in the driving seat. Uh, but you also, that chart also allows you to see some gaps, like misinformation, disinformation, which is not a big deal at that time. AI, uh, again, it's not a big deal. The human rights element, it has been there from the beginning, the people-centered aspect, the inclusion aspect, uh, but the kind of things we've seen since social media platforms became those multi-billion user platforms, 
they were not anticipated at that time. So there are some gaps and those gaps are the one that we need to consider as we look at the build out of the GDC, as we look at Visis Plus 20. How do we address those gaps? Is it repurposing existing forums, you know, uh, tweaking their mandates? Uh, is it just as we are seeing now with the AI space, the creation of this advisory body, that there is room for initiatives? I'm not saying forums, I'm saying initiatives, actions that kind of address those gaps. So that's, Nandini, that's an exercise that's actually already underway. Uh, and we have to be sophisticated, nuanced about it. And we have to, I mean, there is a lot of sometimes misinformation, disinformation about this, that this is somehow centralizing, that, you know, uh, it's uh, pulling things to New York and things like that. And um, I, I've been at pains to emphasize it's exactly the, uh, the contrary. Uh, what we are trying to do is pull together the insights uh, the outcomes of different forums so that people who attend them have a whole of government perspective so that nationally also when policymakers go back and implement there are no gaps so we're talking not only of gaps at the international level but we're also talking of gaps at the national levels where sometimes regulatory capacity is completely missing uh, fortunate are the countries who can afford an e-safety commissioner a data protection commissioner a comp competition policy enforcement regulator, and so on. There are many in which, you know, these functions are actually inside the ministries. So there's a conflict of interest, and you're not up to date with, you know, what is required. So those are the kind of gaps at the national, regional level that we also need to look at. And we need to kind of create the incentive so that those gaps are resolved. And this is a kind of mutual learning, international learning, that needs to be facilitated. So that building should not be just a kind of an empty building. It has to have that fluidity, that exchange, that allows that learning to take place. On Luca's question about bad actors, you know, <laughs> uh, what can I say? You know, I mean, <laughs> it's, um, I think the good have to be more active. They have to be more proactive. I mean, you can't, yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for that. Um, so we move on. And um, without uh, delaying, because we have limited time and we have four um, other speakers, uh, I would like to invite Ambassador Regine Greenberger, Cyber Ambassador from the German Federal Foreign Office. Thank you, Anita. And also, um, thank you for structuring this discussion in, a, in, in this specific way. Uh, I would have preferred to be in the fix it <laughs> part, <laughs> but of course you cannot choose. So uh, what I'm speaking from a um, government point of view, uh, more explicitly perhaps also from a MFA point of view, so foreign affairs, because uh, diplomacy uh, is, is the turf where I feel most comfortable. And some things that I say when describing how we try to help building the GDC is of course um, more normative than you know what we what is what has actually happened, but perhaps it's also my uh, my wishful thinking that it should work out like this. So the first thing uh, that for me is important to um, to state is that this is the moment to acknowledge that the digital gap, the digital divide exists, and that it actually has effects on achieving the sustainable development goals. And the trend is increasing, the, this gap is increasing, this gap is ever growing. And if you imagine AI, quantum computing, the metaverse, it is even more increasing. It's, it, you can expect that it's even more increasing in the future. So it's also really the time to um, reorganize our, our forces, our energy, and try to uh, try again to, to bridge this digital uh, gap. And if you look from it, from a local perspective, for example, from a German uh, perspective, of course, we are industry 4.0 giants in digitization, but also public administration digitization dwarfs. So uh, if we are completely, you know, um, um, uh, only moving in our national domestic environment, we do not see 
uh, this gap or we identify the gap in a different uh, place. And the first thing that I learned and that I would like to, to stress here is that when you speak about the Global Digital Compact, you have to move from the local, national level to, uh, to a global level. And this is uh, really worth it and this will also help uh, reaching the sustainable development goals. This means also involving uh, stakeholders, non-governmental stakeholders. Uh, I mean, for, for Germany, I think for Europeans, this is already in our DNA, but uh, of course, uh, it's still necessary. Then, um, when, um, Germany facilitated re regional um, consultations for Amandip in, uh, in uh, Kenya for the African region, in Mexico City for the, for the Americas, and in in Delhi, uh, 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 for the for uh, some Asian countries, and this was um, not only to help you uh, prepare the global digital compact, but also to collect more context uh, from from the regions uh, for this discussion. We had, um, in the consequence, we had a more informed discussion also in Germany and in Brussels for the U for Europe although we didn't have European consultations in the same way uh, that we had it in, uh, in Nairobi, for example, but uh, we had a more informal, uh, informed discussion about what the GDC is about. And I suspect that if we would have had the regional consultations uh, with Africa and Latin America and so on, before we prepared our European contribution to the Global Digital Compact, this European uh, contribution would have looked differently Be <laughs> because uh, when w as it is it is it is very europe focused and um, we, we we should have reevaluated re our contribution under this perspective of what does it do and how does it work on a global level so the third element I would like to stress is um, what we don't have enough and what we should do more is cross-regional dialogue. And I would like to give you an example where I think this makes absolutely sense. For example, if you look at the top 10 AI uh, companies in the world, there is not a European company among them, there is not an African company among them. So when we, try when we think about sh how to shape global governance structures to govern AI, I think Europe and Africa have a lot uh, in common and we should touch this issue in our cross-regional uh, dialogue across all levels and of course also with non-governmental stakeholders. The fourth element, uh, so I mentioned already the Global Digital Compact is about global challenges, so it has to be a compact on the global level. A regional solution is not enough and will not help reaching reaching uh, the sustainable development goals. The really, the real pot uh, unleashing the potential of digital transformation can only work if we do it on a, on a, in a global scale, which also means, of course, that we have to find ways to mitigate the risks that come with it, and also the risks, like climate change, are risks on a global level and not on a national or regional level. The joint basis that we have for this is, of course, the UN Charter and the Human Rights Charter, but the Global Digital Compact has to do something else. It has to specify how these um, documents from an analog time ap apply to the digital age. And then, of course, also how governments can commit to these principles. So my fifth, my fifth point is, what should be in the Global Digital Compact, except the, you know, the referring to these basic documents, our foundation documents of the United Nations. I just was this morning in a meeting with the Declaration for the Future of the Internet uh, group, and there are five principles there. I think uh, a lot of people also that are not um, uh, adhering to these uh, initiatives can uh, commit to these principles, that is protection of human rights, uh, caring for a global internet, inclusive and affordable access, strengthen di digital trust, protecting the multi-stakeholder internet governance structure. And perhaps as a last point, what I would like to have in the Global Digital Compact is also 
um, a strategic and fixed role for the Internet Governance Forum, for this forum, also as a place to um, negotiate Internet governance uh, also in the future. Thank you so much, Ambassador. I think that it's already building up, uh, and hopefully some of the points that have been mentioned uh, will be taken to the next uh, round. And I particularly want to note the point that you made about uh, the need to really look or relook at the way the Human Rights Charter uh, requires a rearticulation, you know, on the basis of the strengths of its abiding and enduring kind of importance for human civilization, what does the AI age? Uh, really mean, and I think um, that's really important, but sometimes can get contentious. Um, I would like to um, uh, invite Dr. Shamika Serimani, uh, Director, Division on Technology and Logistics from UNCTAD, and everybody in the room is quite familiar with the path-breaking work of the unit, particularly in the form of the collectible, which I suggest everybody um, downloads or uh, takes, which is the Digital Economy Reports. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Anida. Um, uh, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for the opportunity. I don't want to take too much of your time, so let me cut out half of my what I'm supposed to say, but let me uh, emphasize a few things. You see, unlike other technological revolutions, and this is we are in a very special place, because the digital technologies move very, very fast, number one. And also, all technologies are converging towards digital. Okay, so we used to be, to used to take a photo in olden times, I was a chemistry, and it is now digital. So all that stuff, you know, everything is moving, uh, you know, like th there's a convergence happening. So because of that, the opportunities that are open up, especially for developing countries, uh, are there only for a very limited period of time. If you cannot capture the benefits, and these technologies move on. But there are enormous benefits from the, these digital technologies towards, in fact, all SDGs. I mean, we talk about education. I mean, we, we sometimes criticize chat GPT, but there are enormous uh, things that we can do for the education systems, uh, sectors in developing countries. And we can use these technologies for health, the manufacturing, agriculture, I mean, you name it, all SDGs. So the, and the potentials are, are enormous. Now. One of the things that we hear in the CSTD, this is the United Nations Commission for Science and Technology for Development. It's the focal point of the system in the UN system on the science policies, STI uh, conversations. And increasingly we hear when we have the ministers coming to the annual meeting that they are quite concerned that this digital technological revolution is yet again to bypass developing countries. And there's a, there's a real concern. And there's a real concern, the minister's asking us, what do we do with I AI? Everywhere I go in countries, like how do we, what do we do? This AI revolution coming through us. How do you have experience of other developing countries using this? What kind of national strategies that we need to build? So there are enormous amount of questions that are coming our way on this technology science. Just the AI is one thing. I mean, the, the, the all other, uh, other technologies too. And it is, I just want to say, it is not just the access to internet, it's not just the digital divide, as we said in WISIS, but the issues that are raised are much more complex and difficult. Uh, access to internet is one thing, and I think uh, both of you mentioned it's not just the access, it's also the quality of this access and the affordability of this access. And if you look at the least developed countries, and, and they, are, they pay exorbitant, amount of money uh, to, to f for data. And we, in, my, in, in UNCTAD, we work on uh, the preparedness of uh, countries for the digital economy, and we find that the participation in the digital economy is not just about access and even the, uh, the quality of access and the cost of access, but it's also uh, the whole regulatory environment. Like, for example, if I want to have a platform and sell my stuff, and if in my country there are no uh, privacy and there's no pr data protection laws, and which is the case of 50% of the LDCs, and I don't think any of you are going to put your credit card and start buying from my platform. It will not happen. So this is, so it's another aspect. So there's all the regulatory uh, the frameworks 
the skills. You need, it's not just the skills to use the, you know, it's the telephone. You need some form of coding skills, yeah, just to at least to prepare your platform and to get things going. So these skills don't exist. These skills don't exist in least developed countries. Uh, so these are the, and, and among that, one of the other things that's coming up uh, in CSTD is about the whole aspect of data for development. In fact, the CSTD will meet at ministerial level in April on that one of the theme is data for development. And here, thank you, Anita, for uh, sh you know, giving a shout out for the digital economy report. At UNCTAD, in our digital economy report 2021, we called for a global data governance approach so that data can cross borders with trust because you are not going to have international trade and international transactions and international economy if your data you know, cannot uh, cross borders. We said we need to build interoperability. I think there was a question asked, you know, there are big players. Yes, there are big players. 90% of the platforms are owned by big platforms, are owned by just two countries, the US and China. So they are big players. But they're not going to give up on their data governance system. Mm -hmm. So we need to develop interoperability to this data governance system. At the, at the moment, there are three data governance systems. There's a very much the public sector driven data governance system of China, whereas the very much the laissez-faire uh, private sector driven data governance system of the US, and then we have uh, the European Union's GDPR in the middle, the more human-centric data governance. But I don't think none of these groups are gonna give up on their data governance systems because they, are, they depend on their political and development aspirations. So we need to build interoperability. Yes, we know that the data is good for private sector. I mean, it has an economic value, but there are situations where we need to have data sharing too. I think, Ambassador, you mentioned the climate change. You know, these are issues. When we developed the vaccine for COVID-19, it was just because the data was shared very quickly across borders that we managed to, you know, uh, understand and develop the. So we need to have data sharing principles when we talk about. We need to have the whole data privacy security standards I mean, at least common standards that we all can agree. We need ethics. I think, uh, Amandeep, you talk a lot about the whole AI and ethics. So I think this, this as, as we all saying here, this cannot be done just by governments because you need to, you know, if you're going to do AI ethics, you also need the, uh, the industry sitting with you because they are the ones who understands this. And you need the uh, civil society organization because I think every struggle begins I mean, honestly, in activism, I think you need the greater Thunbergs of this world in this, in this data discussions. So it has to have a global, and it has to have a global and a multi-stakeholder approach to data. So let me uh, conclude saying that, you know, all is not lost, and I think we have the GDC process to push forward some of these ideas. And please also don't forget the WISIS plus 20, because WISIS is uh, coming to an end. And, you know, the, the, uh, the principles that you, or the aspirations that you agreed to 20 years ago are very much, you know, they are unfinished business, inclusive and people-centered information society we have not seen. So please also feed into that process with a lot of vigor because it's an, we are undertaking the evaluation. I think part of the work that we will be doing us, the UNCTAD as the secretary of CSTD, the ITU, UNESCO, we are all here to, to talk about WISIS too. So my um, appeal to you is push the many ideas through many of these uh, so we will you know, converge towards the GDC and the summit of the future and we get somewhere. So that's, that's how we can build it. <laughs> I think the key takeaway is struggle. So we, st we shall. So thanks so much. Uh, we move now to Alison, Executive Director of Research ICT Africa. Thank you so much, Anita and Ambassador Gill and colleagues for the, for the input. Um, I guess we all wanted to be in the fix it session. <laughs> um, but I think um, actually the foundational sessions are very important. Not least of all, picking up on some of the points that have ma been made. Um, to really highlight the kind of planetary challenges that we're facing, um, that these are no longer ICT sectoral challenges, they're not 
you know, infrastructure challenges. These are really um, a global problems that we're facing. But also to deal with some of the appropriation of some of the concepts that, um, you know, that we, we're using. Um, I think uh, it's an important part of this process that we return to them and we understand that the implications that we're speaking about are actually um, going to affect the, you know, the, the whole of humanity. And so I, I just would like to remind us of the Secretary General's, um, uh, when he spoke in 2020, of the need for a new social contract for a new era. And I think that's important if we're approaching this issue from a social and economic justice point of view. He described digital transformation as one of two seismic shifts that would shape the 21st century, and of course the other being climate change. Both, he contended, would widen inequalities even further unless urgently addressed on a planetary scale. The Secretary General's identification of the need for a global digital compact to underpin our common agenda to, to arrest these negative trends in a collective and collaborative renewal of the social contract anchored in human rights and gender equality to rebuild trust and social cohesion that people need to see reflected in their daily lives. Highlighting the centrality of digital inclusion in contemporary society, the Secretary General has called for a, a social digital compact that should include updated governance arrangements to deliver better public goods and usher in a new era of universal social protection, health coverage, education, skills, decent work and housing as well as universal access to the internet by 2030 as a basic human right, so all citizens have a say in envisioning countries' futures. And I'm mentioning this because we were part of a, a um, peer review process with the African Union's um, Economic Commission for Africa, sorry, the UN's Economic Commission for Africa, working together with the African Union. Um, and I think, you know, it's, the reflections that I'm going to make are very much um, research, ICT Africa's research, but very much continental reflection and the importance of African voices in these conversations and their absence um, significantly up to now. I think this intervention is required more than ever. I think the layering of in advanced digital technologies um, over the existing inequalities that we have, which are already reflecting underlying structural inequalities, is exacerbating inequality. The compounding effects of digital inequality on existing inequality was highlighted by COVID-19, with a majority of people in Africa unable to mitigate the associated health and economic risks through digital substitution of their access to work, to school, to banking, and even to food. And those at the intersections of these multiple inequalities, including gender, just proportionately succumbing to this disease and the economic fallout, and being le least, best, least pos best positioned to um, prepare for your know, e economic reconstruction. In the African countries su surveyed by Research ICT Africa during and after the COVID-19 COVID pandemic showed that despite the pandemic driving the growth of digital economy globally, the pandemic widened inequalities between those who had internet access prior to the pandemic and, tho and, those, uh, and uh, those who had in, um, access after. This highlights the underlying wicked po policy problem that we face of the digital inequality paradox. And I think it's exactly this paradox this, the social, um, that the Global Digital Compact needs to address. And this um, digital in, um, inequality um, uh, paradox is no longer just that connectivity one where those who are connected and those who are unconnected, you know, the, the gap grows there. This is really to deal with the issues that the, our um, colleagues have already spoken about, with the complexity of this and shifting from a notion of digital divide, a, a kind of infrastructural issue, to dealing with the issues of digital inequality, um, which were mu much more complex. The paradox lies that in, as more people are connected, digital inequality is amplified. But this is not only between those on, online and offline, as in the case of voice um, or basic text in, the, in, in our old environment. It is between those who have the technical and financial resources to use the internet, to transact actively, to produce or pr and prosper, and even to contribute to the wealth of their nations. And those who are barely online, using tiny bits of data intermittently from time to time. Addressing these challenges, we argue in our submission to the Global Digital Compact, um, is that we need a, 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 a governance environment that looks at global regulation of digital public goods. One of the key public goods is, of course, data, but underlying that, and most, far more fundamentally, it is also public statistics. We absolutely don't have the data to assess how far we are 
we think we're eighty five percent of the SDGs, but for Africa we actually we, we simply don't know we simply don't um, have that data. It is this concept of um, public goods and digital public goods that I particularly think has has been appropriated and used and misused um, in, from its classical sense um, as a rationale for for public regulation and I think even in the use of the um, public goods component um, within the Secretary General's office, it's been set up as a public-private um, enterprise essentially to access open, open data. Um, public, digital public goods is far more than, than open data um, or public data. Although public data, as I said, is, is really the basis for this. Without reliable data, there's little way of knowing the progress being made to all these various targets, including the SDGs and, it's, um, and, and the ICT targets that underpin them, um, and it makes it impossible to assess our progress more generally. The current digital indicators used for Africa, and in fact the global data on issues such as gender inequality, are, are based on very patchy data extrapolated from a few data points um, for the whole continent. To move beyond high-level descriptive statistics that can conceal the real determinants of inequality, National representative micro and um, um, macro studies are required to extrapolate this data and build an evidence base. And this needs to be informed by an intersectional inequality approach that can assess the impacts on class, race, gender, ethnicity, um, and importantly, um, in relation to digital access, location. Rural and urban is a major determinant of this. Also, in the kind of scratchy um, data that we have, it presents these groups with, as heterogeneous, um, with uh, highly, as homo highly homogenous groups, whereas we know there's enormous heterogeneity in these categories. And it's not all men and all women that are you know, equally uh, or unequally accessed to these services. It's really only through this more granular data that we can identify these multiple or intersectional aspects of inequality. The diversion of donor and multilateral agendas from regulation of affordable and universal access and digital public goods such as internet data, cybersecurity, to only resourcing the research on advanced data-driven technologies, big data analytics, machine learning and artificial intelligence is in fact exacerbating this digital inequality paradox. Although we still have the rhetoric of, of addressing digital inequality, our resources donor, multilateral, are going towards the, 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 the data and, and AI, um, uh, data-driven uh, technologies. Um, so it's really important um, that if we are going to address digital inequality in the information era, um, you know, it, it, we, need to, we need to address this issue of accessing data. And I think the important issue here is moving in this framework for, for governance of um, digital public goods is shifting um, from a purely social justice perspective and a human rights perspective to looking at a, a perspective that is actually also um, uh, cognizant of the needs for economic justice. I think we need, at the moment, we are looking at primarily individualized, you know, uh, first generation rights preoccupied by privacy. I think it's important, obviously, we don't want to, to lose that. Um, but we really need to look not only at the uneven um, impact and, and the uneven distribution of the negative impacts um, of these data-driven technologies, but we seriously need to look at the uneven distribution of opportunities associated um, with uh, uh, these you know, enor enormously powerful and potentially um, important technologies. And at the moment, I think um, that is not adequately on our agenda because there is the sense that we simply cannot um, you know, regulate uh, the, these big tech companies operating at a global level. Um, we've abdicated some of the responsibilities for uh, the economic regulation that can happen in the underpinning um, you know, infrastructures, et cetera, and, and importantly, of course, now, um, data. Um, just to say that um, you know, I think um, while the compact covers you know, a number of key areas, um, we, yes, we have argued that it's actually the linkages between these different policy areas the broader digital e uh, ecosystem that needs to be addressed in the com com uh, compact. Although we, uh, you know, if we speak about the digital indicators and the need for them, and then we speak about the invisibility, the lack of representation and discrimination of people um, in as outcomes of, of algorithmic um, uh, um, business, um, it's actually the, the linkages of that. We aren't unable, no matter how much we try to have rights-based, ethically designed, um, uh, big data sets that are, you know, we, we can't unbias them. There simply isn't the data to unbias them with half the 
you know, world's population or half of Africa's population, or at least um, not even online. So those, the linkages between these underlying digital inequality and the manifestations that we're seeing in the inequalities is completely different. And, and perhaps lastly, because I've just been asked to, I must, must close off, but I just think we, you know, we can't be saying the same things we've been speaking about, WISIS, and you know, who was there, uh, Tunis and, and, and Geneva. We've got to do things differently. We cannot be continuing to do the same things, using the same policies, and hoping that we have um, different outcomes. Um, it's not just a supply-side structural issue. We have to focus on these are the, 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 all the evidence we have from our surveys is that the challenges are now not infrastructural. They're the old human development challenges. The determinant of whether you have access to the internet or not is education and the associated corollary of, 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 of income. Until we actually address these underlying um, human development challenges, no amount of you know, high-level governance and ethical designs are going to um, ad address these problems. And just to the last point to emphasize very strongly that um, uh, Ambassador Gill and others have made is this is no longer a sectoral policy. It cannot be dealt with by a ministry, a single ministry, a ministry of communications. We need transversal policies that will address the education challenges at the same time that they're addressing higher level, you know, science and technology and um, engineering requirements that we need for, for data science. Thank you so much. I think it's uh, very hard hitting and uh, I think it links also back to what Lucas said a little bit about, you know, being in this kind of bind, uh, but, uh, you know, there is an abdication, there's a political abdication and I think uh, that is something that's completely untenable. I have been singularly unable to keep time, but I think there's one more speaker uh, online and then we can probably decide that we will regroup in a certain way. And so over to you, Renata, who is the head of Open Knowledge Foundation. Um, could uh, she, can you unmute and we'll just check if you're uh, able. To, yes, we are, we are able to hear you. Over to you, Renata. Okay, uh, hi. Um, what you see in the background is uh, like a tweet land in my country. And as, as I was hearing all, this, all the previous speakers, I was thinking of the reality of a country like that, you know, a, a, a country uh, in both in the most vulnerable countries in the world and a country facing economic, political, uh, and uh, societal um, troubles at the moment. We have, if we, we, we had a map and we would see, uh, yeah, we would be able to visualize all the red spots, all the, points in the world right now, uh, living this unprecedented unrest, we will take it into account when we think about global fora and when we, when we think about global initiatives. So the, two, the po two points that I want to address in this build session is that we need to build this uh, global digital compact, taking into consideration that, taking into consideration that like, you know, uh, there are countries that according to predictions of the IMF are about to collapse because of that. There are countries, according to uh, all the predictions on climate, that are going to suffer in the near future catastrophes that they cannot prevent because they don't have the resources to do so. And so with that in mind, that's, I know that it is a rather pessimistic approach, but it's a realistic approach and, and uh, that we need to take when thinking about the digital, global digital uh, compact. We need to understand that people coming to that room will be coming with all these baggage with all these problems and and when you talk about ethics and principles and sophisticated systems of governance the people there in the room will be thinking of so how how am i going to fu to fund this if uh, most of my budget goes to uh, pay that uh, from the creditors countries and and it is, again, you know, a problem of nice words, nice declarations that end up in, in nothing but words because you do not define in advance how is how it's going to be possible for countries in the global south to fund this. So in building the ideal uh, global digital compact, I think that uh, institutions like the IMF should be involved and creditors countries should be involved to give us answer to that and to say maybe we will pardon the debt of countries that are like, you know, in this struggle that are so behind in digitization. And uh, we, uh, that, uh, 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 that money will be allocated instead of, you know, like uh, being paid by the countries every time 
to develop the robust digital infrastructure that is needed. That requires political will, of course. The second thing that we need to be aware while designing this ideal uh, digital compact is power dynamics. Are we going to invite in the room and give additional layer of power to the most powerful actors that we have on planet Earth at the moment, and by those I, I refer, refer to the big tech companies. There's this constant and constant and constant uh, uh, discourse of, oh, we, we need to invite them at the table. The, the problem is that many times in many countries, they own the table. And, 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 and sometimes in some, in some situations, you know that they have like gone so far to capture and uh, think tanks to capture academia, to capture civil society and so on. So when, when designing this uh, global digital compact, special attention should be paid to tame the power of big tech and not to be like just, you know, like the low hanging fruit for them to shape globally the future uh, of, of our, our digital uh, society. Uh, one quick example of that is skills. Of course, it is very important in, in this uh, uh, to address the, the unmet promise of knowledge equality and skills. But if those, if, if what we are like doing through the cooperation between private sector and um, public sector in, on skills development is just, just to prepare the workers that will be useful for them uh, and to keep the monopolies growing, we have a problem. Uh, the other uh, aspect that is very, very important uh, to address and to bring in as well is to remove block. Uh, the, when we, we saw the COVID crisis, we were very aware of the blocks on sharing knowledge and sharing capacities and sharing infrastructure. Uh, we still have with a 20th century, we still have a 20th century copyright system. We still have a 20th century uh, patent system that is not enabling cooperation in the way that we need. I think that issues like intellectual property should be like addressed at this uh, global digital compact. I know that those are not like the sexy topics anymore, that the sexy topic is AI, but I think that if we do not address the problem of global north, global south inequalities in, in terms of access to knowledge and access to patents, uh, we will be like um, far behind and we will never meet the goals of like saving the planet and, and, and connecting the disconnected. And last, I think, and, and uh, it is the, the issue of uh, um, geopolitics and the role of the press. I think that for the, this global digital compact to be successful, um, it would be incredible to involve from the first stages, global and local uh, representatives from the media because many times the narrative is shaped in a way uh, from not complete, complete awareness of the processes or not complete uh, technical knowledge of, of what's going on in, in the digital sphere. I prepare a quick presentation because uh, one of the um, these uh, build it, uh, um, fix it, this dynamic is uh, that I read was to make it visual. So I would like to share quickly how I see it and how I, I see that uh, we can meet the goals in a second. Uh, Renata, um, can you wind up in a minute? Is that okay? Yes, 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 yes. It's going to be very, 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 very quick. Uh, so, so ideally our global digital compact will fix knowledge inequalities and will be a power balance act without replicating uh, exploitation and extractivism. It will advance people's rights and involve the people in shaping it. It will be reproducible impact as the result. It will unlock the possibilities of technology fast. And that's why I mentioned the removal of the patents uh, blocked. Uh, it will bring people together and it will also bring other fora, but avoid the new extractive dynamics and participation washing of tokenism and people who do not really shape the process. Uh, it will be sustainable for the people uh, and for the planet. It will be generative and it will, uh, will be not only the, that the uh, underprivileged uh, communities will be the, in, on the receiving end, but it will activate the creative power of individuals and communities. And I think that for that purpose, uh, the role of all the social innovation layer uh, uh, should be taken into account and uh, will be rooted in the local, but interoperable. And hopefully we'll have exponential impact and dissemination.
So I guess that with that and, and knowing that it was very limited time to on, unpack all of this, I think that that uh, uh, global digital compact that says how uh, are they going to fund this and does not depend only on um, voluntary contributions, but on serious commitments uh, from the countries of the global north to the global south. A uh, uh, global digital compact that invites and interconnects the financial issues and the climate issues and the uh, knowledge inequality issues and bring them uh, to the same table. And uh, um, a global digital compact that recognizes and addresses with meaningful acts the imbalance of power uh, uh, that big tech companies uh, bring and the dynamic that they, they, they uh, cause when they are like the persons uh, with equal power in the room than civil society. If that is addressed, I think that uh, we have all the elements for a successful global digital compact. Thank you so much. If only we had changed the, the World Trade System, IP system, and the entire debt paradigm. Just about 40 years ago, I think we would not be here, and we would have certainly been able to reap the aspirations of the WSIS. Now we have compounded issues. Um, if, uh, with your permission, what I could do is take on some very fierce and more hard-hitting statements from the Break It Round, and why uh, perhaps uh, all the aspirational and pragmatic statements from the first round of speakers uh, may need to be subject to some kind of skepticism. I think we could perhaps do like a five to six minute uh, input from each of you and then have a half an hour slot for discussion. So um, I would like to open up the next round right away so that we can take inputs and then break for uh, a period of discussion. So over to you, Helene from uh, Lanesia. Thank you. Anita, your remit was to act within the particular one third of this. So let me try to do this because you can say on the one hand, on the other hand, but let me just stick to the one hand. I, the one I hand. think the GDC was a damned if you do, damned if you didn't. There were great consultations. People were flown across the world. People are still flying across the world on this. It was, uh, for the skeptic, a great way to spend government money and uh, civil society money on private sector airplanes. Uh, could we not have done this whole thing with a lot more online consultation and written these statements? Certainly looking at the current March 2023 or uh, May 2023 draft, it looks like this is the stuff that certainly civil society has been talking for 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, so could we not have done it for a lot cheaper and the money, particularly let's say some government spent on this, could that not have been actually spent on bridging the digital divide, getting the right kind of institution set up in our countries, developing capacity of uh, government. Second, a lot of the process involved keeping civil society in one track, having consultations, government in another track and so on, and then regionally civil society. I think that was absolutely important because there was a lot each group had to say. Uh, and not all civil society is alike. Sometimes the process didn't really recognize that not all civil society was alike. It brought us together as if we all wanted the same thing. I think there's enough nuances. But now the issue is how the real sticky points, forget within civil society, is how the challenge of negotiating between civil society and sometimes private sector and government is going to take place. At this point, it looks like Amandeep and the team are somehow going to sit and use their brain cells to do this. I think that's really poor form to not keep the rest of us informed as to what the next steps are, because that's the real negotiation between civil society who is perhaps at one extreme and other parties. And that's, I think, really important in terms of implementing next steps, because otherwise civil society could have got together and written this statement by ourselves, right? So that's the real challenge before the September Global Summit. And that has to be a long, structured, facilitated process. Third, it calls in the current draft for funding commitments from governments, donors, multilaterals, etc. But the situation right now in certainly South Asia, some Southeast Asian countries, some Latin American countries that Renata referred to, and very soon African countries, is that we are facing 
a kind of inflation-driven, COVID-driven fiscal squeeze where every dollar coming in is going to food, social safety payments, water, electricity. Nobody is going to ask and negotiate for digital-related funding, right? So who is going to pay for this is a fundamental question we have. And the poorer the country, the poorer government, I mean, we're in IMF bailouts, mine included. Several of my neighbors are about to go into. Some Latin American countries are to in the 20-somethings round of IMF bailout. So what are we talking about in terms of funding, if not for very basic necessities? And governments are not thinking about ICT and digital as basic necessities. So what they're doing is either ignoring ICTs or wanting an AI plan so they can create jobs. And when some funder comes and says, well, you need to think about rights, very quickly cut and paste from a European policy that's completely unimplementable with the capacity and the money that we have, right? So in this, then in terms of funding comes the big question of taxation. There's a conversation about global digital taxation. Right now, this is a place where a global compact could really come into play because there's no more global conversation about how we somewhat equitably uh, share the benefits of large global technology where the large user base are from the majority countries, but the companies are elsewhere. But this global compact mentions none of this. And instead, the global South countries are sitting looking at an OECD proposal, which is looking multilateral, but one big country that we shall not name has no interest in participating and is delaying the whole negotiation. Multiple UN proposals, which are all meant to be bilaterally negotiated between tiny countries and large countries, which is never going to happen, or individually come up, coming up with digital tax regimes, right? Which the global companies might be able to con uh, comply with, but small platforms are going to die if they have to comply with one rule in Nepal and one rule in Sri Lanka, right? And so the Global Digital Compact doesn't address this fundamental issue of global taxation. And it's related to financing. The last point I want to make is that this is presented as something that is led by nation states uh, in a multilateral system. And we do need functioning multilateral systems with significant multi-stakeholder participation. That is as it should be. But setting this in a multilateral system that is dysfunctional is a fundamental problem. Where is the accountability? We talk about uh, stopping internet fragmentation in one of the pages of the current draft. So who is going to hold accountable the country that runs the largest firewall in the world when they are doing so much more to fragment the internet than anyone else? And let me you know, offend everyone, including my country, which just came up with an online safety bill, which is nothing but curbing speech of people that they don't like and speech they don't like. So this is you know, equally equal opportunity offense. So where is the multilateral system accountability for holding their own members to account? I mean, this is going to be another dysfunctional UN Security you know, Council, which can't stop millions of people from being killed. Right? That's a much more important thing. So what are we thinking about in digital governance? Like how are we going to hold rogue nations to account? And there are many. I'm not even going to talk about companies. I think Renata talked about companies. I'll just stop there. Thank you. Yes, I think it's sufficiently broken. <laughs> but I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but more. <laughs> yes. Um, I would like now for Ali, Ali Costa Barbosa, fellow of the Weizenbaum Institute and also someone who is a member of the Homeless Workers uh, Movement uh, technology sector from Brazil. Would you like to speak from there? Or would you like to? You have inspiration in your predecessor, so you can. Yeah. I think I will build a bit more than break now, no? yeah. <laughs> after that one. Um, so, first I'd like to thank Anita on behalf of IT for Change and the Global Dish Digital Justice Forum for inviting me uh, in such an important debate that shall influence the activities of the IGF in the following days. I hope I can break it in a way I can contribute to fixing it. With honor, I, I'm speaking as a coordinator for the Homeless Workers Movement Technology Sector in Brazil. The housing movement accounts for roughly 30,000 people and for a bottom-up approach 
it has been doing in practice in the territories some of what the GDC is claiming for, such as promoting meaningful connectivity, digital public education, and this and digital labor. So I invite all of you to, to join our networking session to learn more about our work. Considering the gaps in the UN Global Digital Compact, I don't think civil society organizations find the process legitimate, but I would like to highlight two key dimensions on GDC substance, sustainable digital public infrastructures and AI and labor. GDC alludes to sustainable digital public infrastructure, but it should be more precise about sustainable DPI. There is no multi-stakeholder consensus around its definition, and forum like IGF could enable this. Instead, GDC reinforces interoperable open accessible DPIs, but supported primarily through actions of multilateral organizations, which supported by big tech-related big foundations have shaped what DPI is in practice. The G20 had different tasks, task forces to promote digital public infrastructure at the last meeting in New Delhi. If you look closely, you see they have quite different definitions of DPI. Internet pioneer Ethan Zuckerman defines infrastructure as, as a set of technologies and systems for the healthy functioning of society. Nevertheless, the G20 synthesis document restricts it to digital ID, payment methods, and platforms for consent-based data sharing. It is really important, but it is not enough for that, at least for the majority of the world. The DC must consider digital public infrastructure as a general purpose or essential infrastructure inf or platforms, even if sectoral. As mentioned by some colleagues in the first round, a multi-level approach is necessary, although it is missing. Search engines work at a global level, and social media as well. Healthcare, education, and social protection platforms work at the national levels. Why don't multilateral organizations foster that development? It calls for action on digital technologies for education and social protection, but it could be more explicit on digital infrastructure for education, for instance. At the municipal or even lower levels, mobility, house rental and food delivery, and labor platforms should be considered. So why not create data infrastructure and human rights-oriented policy frameworks to promote local sustainable innovation? including developing countries in the digital economy through digital connectivity infrastructure, capacity building, and access to technology and technological innovations is important, but it's also not enough. Digital and data economies are utterly dependent on substantially concentrated cloud economy, being two-thirds of its market shared on Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. L look, uh, IBM and Oracle combine and account for more than Alibaba and Tencent, so solely antitrust at the local level will not solve the problem. This valid extraction enables these companies to build parallel private networks, which has been considered a threat to internet fragmentation by the policy network. So if we intend to level the playing field and promote data for development, why is data infrastructure not considered digital public infrastructure? Even if we acknowledge that the big players will not give up on their data governance. Again, GDC claims for sustainable DPI, as evident by the policy network on environment report, DDC's policy brief should have mentioned the carbon digital footprint. The document also says the potential of digital technology in tracking supply chains, but does not refer to the digital technology supply chain itself. What about the satellites, the fiber optical cables, the transmission towers, just regarding internet telecom related infrastructures? Moreover, to talk about digital technologies, we must consider Colton extraction in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Linto in Bolivia, or even gold in the Amazon rain forest as to ensure social environmental digital justice. Um, AI regulation and governance debate must include labor discussions, notwithstanding the GDC ref references the application of lab labor rights, act in partnership with the International Labor Organization. At the G7 summit in May, digital and technology ministers committed to further discussing diverse generative AI aspects, called the Hiroshima AI process before mentioned. Nothing on labor. The same is true within the G20 and the policy network on artificial intelligence in IGF. Until when, why not consider it? In the Brazilian scenario, the multi-stakeholder public consultation on platform regulation held by the, by the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee considered among its four pillars decent work. Some, is, some issues have multi-stakeholder consensus, such as algorithm control, transparency, and democratic labor platform governance but it still lack attention to micro workers' role in developing AI systems. That's not to mention the impact of generative AI on the workforce. If you do not think of workers-led AI governance, like the Hollywood writers one, 
we will not see improvement in livelihoods, but the opposite. Maybe, dear colleagues, I am too optimistic to believe that novel proposals for the International Division of Labor could come out of the Internet Governance Forum. So is GDC really transformative? No, um, unfortunately it, it is not yet, but it can be, otherwise I hope none of us would be here. The Internet Governance Forum is crucial for achieving these SDGs. However, if IGV, IGF anticipates those critical dimensions, only if IGF anticipates those critical dimensions, it will likely succeed in meaningfully contributing to the roadmap for the digital cooperation. To conclude, uh, with humility, allow me to echo President Lula's statement during the United Nations General Assembly a few weeks ago. The UN's broadest and most ambitious collective action aimed at development, the 2030 Agenda, could turn into its biggest failure. Thank you, Anita. Issues that are not on the table are as important. Yeah, and that is our aim. Yes. Okay, so I move over to our next speaker, Nandini Chami, online, Deputy Director of IT for Change. Uh, thank you, uh, Anita. Uh, so today I will be speaking on behalf of uh, IT for Change as well as the Global Digital Justice Forum, a network of development organizations, uh, digital rights uh, groups, trade unions and feminist organizations who have been working together to advance the cause of uh, digital justice and specifically engaging with the global digital compact uh, process in this uh, regard. And IT for Change is also a member of this uh, group. And uh, just without much ado, just to kind of like, you know, continue to uh, break this. I think a lot of this uh, task has been completed uh, already. So uh, when we look at the global digital compact from a global south perspective, I think that there are two major unresolved concerns. And some of these concerns have come across multiple times in the public consultations that were held in the GDC process, especially from civil society groups in the south. So the first concern is that this was also discussed in the last uh, round that when you look at like the global digital governance scene 20 years after the uh, visits, we see that there is a particular vitiation of the democratic multi-stakeholderism vision of the visits all these years. And we are ending up with a world where we see the digital governance space captured by a few powerful transnational digital corporations and dominant states and the bad actors, so to speak, as was discussed in the first session. So in the world where the complexity of digital as a cross-cutting transversal policy issue has only grown, if we were not able to fix these institutional arrangements question even after the tuners now the institutional challenge is only growing and is what is offered in the global digital compact right now adequate to this and i believe the answer is a no and i'll just get to that in a moment the second major concern is that today we all know that uh, data governance directions are extremely important. And as was again mentioned in round one, it's not just about privacy and personal data protection, but it's about how do you govern cross-border data flows for development sovereignty of all countries in the digital co economy. And here too, I believe the Global Digital Compact uh, falls short. So just to get to a, a slightly more detailed uh, peek of both these issues, uh, let's take the question of the institutional arrangements for global digital justice uh, as proposed by the UN Secretary General in his July 2023 policy brief. So we see that the policy brief has like two things. So one is the constitution of a tripartite digital policy space, the digital cooperation forum in the short term, and in the long term, the proposal is to establish a global commission on just and sustainable digitalization. 
So if you take the case of the Digital Cooperation Forum, many examples are invoked, most strikingly the ILO mechanism and the membership of private entities in the ITU. And there is a proposal that the Digital Cooperation Forum should be a new tripartite dialogue modality for follow-up on the GDC commitments by states, private sector, and civil society. Unfortunately, there is no ground norm clarifying the rights and duties of these stakeholder groups or the process through which non governmental stakeholders are going to be nominated to the proposed Digital Cooperation Forum's policy table. There is the idea of involving small and medium-sized enterprises as well as startups through representative bodies at this uh, policy table through a quota, but just by this tokenistic representation, would that be sufficient to neutralize the agenda set power of big corporations, this is something we should think about. And this point has already come up. The status of the Digital Cooperation Forum vis-a-vis -vis the business consensus is unclear. How will the Internet Governance Forum and the Digital Cooperation Forum stand in relation to each other? And if the Digital Cooperation Forum is planned as the enhanced cooperation mechanism that was never set up after the business, how will the legitimate public policy space and duty of states to work for economic and social development of people in the new digital paradigm be secured by the GDC process. Coming to the long-term proposal of the Global Commission on Just and Sustainable Digitalization, uh, this body is imagined as an enabler of multi-stakeholder cooperation between state, civil society, and private sector in all uh, futuristic uh, issues of like inclusive and sustainable uh, digitalization, which is the connectivity plus plus we have all been talking about. And the key formula that is mentioned for this is to move beyond traditional interstate cooperation to a new networked multilateralism. But in this new networked multilateralism, again, Without a clear separation of the rules, responsibilities, and the powers of state and non-state actors in the distributed decision making, this will just end up like leading to, again, uh, consolidating the capture of global digital co uh, uh, cooperation arrangements and the governance debates by powerful big tech actors, which is a problem we have been facing for uh, more than 20 years now. And coming to the second issue of the directions for data governance, uh, the Secretary General's policy brief says that the convergence on principles for data governance, that is to be negotiated in a separate process, the Global Data Compact, uh, the date and timelines for which are not mentioned or raised now. And this evidently means that the most contentious issue in global digital cooperation, which is about the jurisdictional sovereignty of states to exercise controls over cross-border flows of their citizens' data resources and deal with associated implications for human rights, national security, trade, competition, taxation, and overall internet governance will remain unresolved. And we already know from the UNCTAD Digital Economy report that the lack of rules on this issue entrenches the extractive neo-colonial data economy that we are all very unhappy with. So coming to just a final set of like points, uh, I think that in the new institutional arrangements for global digital governance, uh, I completely understand the point that we can't go back to an anachronistic, uh, you know, past, but uh, somewhere we have to sit and think about the Tunis vision because uh, we are not able to understand like, you know, how to make democratic multi-stakeholderism work. And if we are like leaping into a new network multilateralism uh, phase without actually thinking about the institutional checks and balances, we are actually ending up with old wine in new bottle as the adage goes. And coming to the governance of uh, data, uh, we all agree that a shared multilateral vision on the access to and use of data resources is uh, totally lacking today. And we all know that the cross-border data flows uh, question is not just about privacy and personal data protection. So how are we going to talk about development sovereignty as the collective rights of peoples to determine how their aggregate data resources are utilized and enjoy their rightful claims in the benefits of data-enabled knowledge? Uh, so from my perspective, the Global Digital Compact is broken on both these counts, and if we have to fix it, we have to fix both these questions of institutional governance deficit and the very, very urgent challenge of looking at development sovereignty as uh, data sovereignty. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, 
that's very important, I think, to connect the older issues that were pointed out in, and in all of the economic fault lines. Globally, we see uh, questions around sovereignty keep uh, you know, coming back. Um, I'd like to now uh, call upon Megan uh, from Afronomics Law, Kenya. Megan, you're also online. Thank you, Anita. I hope all of you can hear me. Um, yes, yes, we can. All right, great, thank you. So I'll begin, I'll largely share two gaps of the GDC brief. And I'd like to begin by stating that there's an often recited position that the historical choices of respect to internet governance have enabled big tech's rise and shaped the current um, digital, regu digital regulatory dilemmas and that the post versus multi-stakeholderism um, process has achieved little for global digital constitutional landscape. And so while the policy brief from the United Secretary General on the GDC emphasizes the urgent need to reshape the trajectories of digitalization and human digitality, it gaps, it gaps risk entrenching the digital regulatory dilemma. So one of the gaps in my view of the GDC includes one, um, the brief fails to acknowledge the notion that rights are protected by the fulfillment of duties and that merely expecting states to refrain from certain actions without duties may not be enough. On this ambit, um, the brief in a series of proposed objectives and actions of member states, uh, the GDC envisions that member states would commit to a laundry list of actions under the seven uh, main thematic areas. For instance, member states are expected to commit to avoiding blanket internet shutdowns, which will run counter to efforts to close the digital divide. And also, um, member states are, are, are expected to commit together with technology developers and digital platforms to reinforce transparency and accountability measures in AI systems. However, there is no mention of how such commitments from states will be attained. And therefore, there's also a failure by the brief and the GDC to take cognizance of the power of big corporations to set agendas to their favor. As we've seen in the AI system of late, um, the European AI Act was influenced by big tech corporations. Um, therefore, to be effective, the compact, the GDC must go beyond seeking mere commitments from states and corporate actors and should ensure or come up with a regime of how consequences for inaction by both states and corporate actors, sorry, um, how consequences for inaction may be levied on both states and corporate actors. And therefore, this ultimately requires dealing with the real politic of digital, digital governance head on. The second gap in the GDC would relate to the idea of there's a failure of upholding human rights holistically. So the brief does not uphold human rights adequately in the sense that it does not capture the indivisibility of human rights and therefore fails to put the economic, social, and cultural rights on the same footing as civil and political rights. The digitalized work precarity in the gig economy, for instance, coupled with the incursion of big tech into the health and agricultural sector, for instance, are threatening individual and communities' right to a decent living, the right to health, the right to education, and the right to enjoy the benefits of scientific progress and so on. Internet shutdowns, for instance, not only undermine the connectivity divide, but also the right to education, for, for instance, for students relying on remote education and other economic and social rights. On a related note that Nandini, Nandini has also mentioned is the reduction of data rights to the singular agenda of individual privacy and personal data protection, of which this ignores the economic, social, and cultural rights implicated in data value chains. So um, those will be my main contributions in terms of the gaps of the GDC. So lastly, to make a point on the, uh, on the possibility of digital justice, it is worthwhile to know that it is possible worth pursuing digital justice by attaining a just digital future requires a radical shift of our social politics where equality and economic policies to distribute. The benefits of technology equally are made primal and the inequalities brought about by digital capitalism, intellectual monopoly, and rent extraction are overhauled. To attain, to attain global digital justice, the GDC needs to learn also from the ill-fated versus mandated um, complementary process of enhanced cooperation. Um, over to you, and Anita. Thank you so much, Megan, for also reinforcing points that were made earlier. Is Dennis in the room? Yes, hi. Dennis, 
Oh wow! So um, there was already quite a bit of breaking. I think I'm the last one in the in the row, right? And I'm um, trying to lead. Um, I'm a researcher, Dennis Redeker, uh, from the University of Bremen, Germany, and so I'm not really a southern perspective on this uh, global digital compact, but I'm trying to let the empirical evidence from recent studies speak um, for itself. This is why I brought uh, a few slides. It's not, it's not long, not at all. Um, um, do you see the... Oh, wonderful. Um, when... When thinking about a global digital compact a while ago, I thought, well, the, the one puzzle that I have is in spite of the consultations, in spite of many people being drawn into the process, uh, regular users, regular citizens, as much as policymakers uh, here in the room, um, I felt it's not clear to me what people actually want and think, and particularly um, who they want to be at the table, who they want to be particularly uh, listened to in the consultation. So I put this on a uh, larger survey um, uh, of uh, around 17 and a half thousand people in 41 countries uh, and I asked these questions. I had to, if I asked questions about a global digital compact, I, I knew I couldn't ask about complex detailed questions of the consultations because people will not be attuned to these kind of questions and they might not have an opinion. Um, so I asked three questions essentially. Um, the first is, uh, who should ideally provide input into the writing uh, of the global digital compact to the UN? Um, then the question, who do you think in reality provides input into that process? Uh, and thirdly, I asked people also about the kind of principles on a, on a kind of very basic level. What are the most important things for you? Privacy, freedom of suppression, what should be in there? If anything, what should be um, taken care of by, by this process? Uh, this survey, as I said, 41 countries, uh, six different languages, ran November last year till March this year. Uh, and this is online-based um, recruitment through social media. It is only social media users, Facebook and Instagram. Uh, we can talk more about the limitations, but that's here. It's a different, different forum. Um, the first question I had was, uh, who should actually have uh, input in this? Um, and surprisingly, technical experts were, were asked most for. Um, almost 60% of the respondents said technical experts. Uh, academics, uh, about 50% of the people said that. Um, citizens themselves, 45%. Approximately 40% uh, said civil society and NGOs, uh, national governments 35%, uh, uh, businesses only 20%. So only 20% of the people think that the businesses should be listened to when the global digital compact um, uh, consultations take place. Uh, and then, um, if you just compare this to what people think, who actually gets to say something? Uh, people say, well, technical experts get a say. Academics are not being listened to. Citizens are not being listened to. Um, civil society is being listened to, NGOs are. Um, national governments are not being listened to, surprisingly. Um, but people think that businesses are more listened to than they should be, according to their own normative preferences. So I found these results a bit um, um, interesting. And I think it, it does bring something to the table when it comes about breaking uh, kind of the, the concept or the, the GDC or the consultations, because it seems there's definitely a mismatch between the general populations and the countries. Uh, looked at and uh, what is going on. Um, and these are the desired principles that people wanted to be included uh, and most included uh, security for children online, security of privacy online, fighting hate speech online, protection of intellectual property, interesting also online, greater cultural and linguistic diversity. And you can see actually they're going down there and the least often open source, open data, um, um, and so on. Uh, just two small slides actually here. Um, there are obviously differences between countries. If we look at um, the principle of no censorship, then we have uh, a lot of countries where this is strongly emphasized, Latin America, for example, in the survey, and Eastern Europe, but not so much in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa or in Southeast Asia. Um, when we look, on the other hand, a greater cultural and linguistic diversity as a principle for the Global Digital Compact, then we see that is particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, there is a strong emphasis on, on that. Um, relative to other countries, but it's also quite emphasized in, in Latin America. Um, yeah, that's it already. Um, thank you very much. Um, funding disclaimers. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Dennis. Uh, very clearly, I think, um, experiences of uh, what to build and how to fix may be very contextual, but why it's broken might perhaps have a very slender and beautiful and simple narrative, and I think that comes through. What we can do is uh, take some time now for comments uh, so that if there are people from the first round and the second round who may want to weigh in on the comments from the room, then we could direct those. I request everyone to keep your comments uh, short, but please 
contribute to breaking and building, and then maybe the, the wisest of us all in the room will fix it. Any questions online? Um, I, I guess everyone is ready to go to fix it. But uh, Timothy, are you still there? There's a comment here. Um, anyone online that wants to come in? Renata, go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, just a very quick comment on, on uh, the geopolitical aspect of it. I think that in, in breaking it is very important. Because uh, currently, you know, like there's a lot of tensions among the big powers, uh, basically playing a fundamental ro role in tech, concretely US and the tensions with China, then we have Russia and so on. So I think that for the uh, global digital compact to be effective, to, to it truly needs to engage all the key actors. So I think that uh, BRICS is going to play a very interesting role in this. And it would be a pity not to, like you know, connect the efforts of G20 and OECD and so on, with the efforts of the G77, the efforts of uh, around BRICS, and and the efforts of the 20 vulnerable. I think that what it would be like very, very, very important, and and is to welcome everyone at the table, regardless of the political tensions that are like you know uh, that the world is going through. And the other thing is to. And I am biased here because I'm Latin America to leverage on Brazil is historical leadership, uh, which will be like at the, at next year at the G20, presiding the G20, but it's also the force behind uh, the revival of BRICS to uh, be the connecting point uh, uh, at this fora. And the civil society in Brazil that is so powerful. It might be like a, a key when, when uh, both in the breaking process and in the fixing process of this uh, multilateral uh, moment. Thanks, Renata. Go ahead. Thank you for this, this comment, Renata. Uh, indeed, uh, Brazil is leading the G20 uh, meeting next year, and f as follows will be South Africa, so pretty much uh, related to the BRICS agenda. And I think we have a, we must play a, re a really strong role in shaping what this, the, the buzzword of this IGF, which is digital public infrastructure. We can be pretty sure that we'll be on there, like protesting in front of the the meeting, um, and also that it's probably going to take place, we can fully discuss during this IGF, if it's going to take place, the the Net Mundial plus 10, that I think is going to, can be a, a really good, a really important uh, meeting also to, to shape the GDC and the, the Summit of the Future and so on. Uh, I'd like just to make a comment really briefly as well, like on, on I think it's a good aspect of the GDC that it's mentioning the, the need of instituting public education for digital literacy. And but I think it's missing something like concrete, uh, good examples on, of that. Like I would re be really glad to hear from any of you, from in internet governance, schools, coordinators, or even uh, in sessions during this IGF of really concrete programs for teaching emancipatory digital literacy in public schools in accordance with the Abdijan principles. I say this because we are doing this in the, in the Homeless Workers Movement. We've been uh, in partnership with public schools in Sao Paulo, and I'd be glad to share that. And if I had time, Dennis, I'd like to hear a bit more about the profile of these respondents. Uh, I think it was interesting to see how they are concerned about like children's rights. In the, it's it's, it's a really good outcome to see like, people are, are somehow aware of, of the risks of the digital. Thank you. Okay, so are we then set to move anybody online that wants to come back? Thanks, Renata. <laughs>
for those who can see, there's uh, Renata's little one there. Um, yes. So all, all ready to fix it. <laughs> uh, I guess you have to speak. Maybe then we just, I, I can't, yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. I think um, from pragmatism to skepticism to hope, uh, Renata, thank you. So we move to uh, the final round. And um, Anna, are you here already? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so we hope that you will tie everything together. And Ali said that you know maybe uh, people know it all. So that is a very important segue uh, to go into. Uh, so Anna Christina Ruelas, senior program specialist from UNESCO. Welcome. So I don't know if I'm the wisest one to fix this, and, uh, but I'm happy to be in the fixed session. <laughs> because I think um, we, uh, we at UNESCO really aim uh, with our work to try to fix uh, some of the issues, acknowledging that actually there's no one only actor that is able to, that to, to solve all these issues that you have already mentioned. But, um, we are aiming to actually think on um, how this multi-stakeholder approach will actually look like when it comes to, for instance, dealing with digital platform governance systems and how we manage to balance and create a balance between freedom of expression, safeguarding freedom of expression, access to information with dealing with potential harmful content such as disinformation, hate speech or conspiracy theories that we are seeing that is scaling online. Um, so I, I want to start very quickly saying that UNESCO has been working since a year ago with a set of consultation, uh, a broad consultation process on guidelines for the governance of digital platform. And actually this is one of the elements that will inform the Global Digital Compact and the Summit of the Future in 2024. And why does it inform it? Because what we are aiming here is to try to create a document that will guide the process of uh, the governance of digital platform, acknowledging that when we talk about governance, we are talking about a coherent system where different regulatory arrangements can coexist, uh, meaning that there's we acknowledge that there's self-regulation, we acknowledge that there's core regulation and there's a statutory regulation that has to happen and that has to safeguard, in any case, freedom of expression and access to information. We don't want regulation to become a new layer of exclusion or discrimination because we know that there's regulation that is happening in different parts of the world that doesn't even mention or acknowledges freedom of expression even though they are trying to regulate content. And we know that there's regulation that does put in the in the straight, in the, in the in their core human rights approach and, 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 and that is happening there and it is creating divisions and it is creating a huge, um, a huge, a, a huge layer of exclusion in our point of view. So th these guidelines um, are very much focused on the structures and processes uh, for digital platforms to identify potential harmful content. Um, uh, it tries to create an, uh, a knowledge that these governance systems is dependent of a multi-stakeholder uh, participation. And I have to stop here because I've heard a lot about what does it mean, multi-stakeholderism, and actually during the consultation process, this was one of the questions that we made because we wanted to know what you know, what civil society, what is the role that civil society wants to, 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 to fill in when it comes to a whole regulatory cycle, not only in participating in regulatory processes, but then in the monetary and evaluation in all of the process of regulatory cycle. And, and, and w one of the things that we realize is that it is, it is a conversation that is mostly breaked. I mean that there's a silos conversation where regulators talk to each other once the policy is being approved by the legislators and then the regulators never talk with the companies, the companies never talk with the regulators, not with the civil society. There's a whole tension between the different actors. And 
so one of the things that we're aiming at the next stage when the, when the guidelines are approved is to try to combine and create a regulatory or a framework of network of networks where regulators, civil society organizations, um, companies, uh, media, uh, uh, academia, think tanks can participate and discuss among what are those indicators from the global, regional, local level that have to be observed when it comes to governance of digital platforms. So for instance, there's many regulators that have told us, and I, and I, <laughs> I have a question here, uh, that they never participated in their internet governance forum. They, ha they have never been part of this, and that they are now given the, um, the responsibility to attend to these, all these issues. And they haven't even discussed about, you know, like what are the different layers of the responsibilities of each one of the companies, what are, et cetera. And right now, in another session, the, the, the companies were saying, you know, like we never talk with the regulators and we are being regulated. <laughs> so it's, um, it's, a, it's a problem of, of breaking the silos and also creating a discussion where other thing that regulators mention is that we never talk with civil society. Civil society talks with the policymakers, you know, but then we don't understand what are the different problems that are happening uh, among, you know, when, when regulation comes into, into place. So if we understand how it's being put in place, if what is the effect that is having in other things, then we could do something. So creating networks for us is a key issue uh, to identify potential follow-ups, potential way to identify how governance of digital platforms could work. And and I when I say networks, we never think about a global network or we can think about a global network, but we need to go bottom down and understand that there will be always local indicators that will be very important to follow up and they will be prioritized in each in one country and then regional uh, regional indicators that will be prioritized in, the, in, 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 in other regional countries. For instance, in, in Africa, there were many uh, specific comments about making sure that threat risk mechanisms were translated in the languages of the of the people because right now uh, it, it's, it's not possible to 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 uh, access to those redress mechanisms and other countries they say you, we need to focus on vulnerable marginalized communities so I think what, what what I mean with this and what I want to to think about this is that for us fixing it means to actually give in meaningfulness to the work multi-stakeholder because we say it a lot, <laughs> we mention it a lot, but when it comes to an actual question of what does it mean in actual action, you know, like with a specific action um, to follow by each one of the of the actors, it it doesn't have an, a, an actual answer. So what we want to is as UNESCO is to after launching the guidelines to convene all of you to participate and to work together to define specifically how to actually start defining the word multi-stakeholderism in the global in the, in the in the governance of digital platform but most specifically in the governance of digital platform in local regional and global level so that would be my uh, participation thank you just to be a little bit mischievous i think we should ask maybe somebody from the break it group to ask a question to anna are you convinced by the answer of course, she didn't uh, want to give answers to everything, but she did speak about, uh, she addressed Renata's point about participation washing. Renata, are you convinced? Is she there? Ah, Nandini, go ahead, please. Uh, yeah. I have a question, and I think uh, Renata also has a question because she raised her hand now. Um, uh, so uh, my question to Anna is, uh, I completely understand that, you know, multi-stakeholderism has kind of become an empty signifier and we need to accord meaning to it. Uh, but in the current way that we have, like, you know, treated this multi-stakeholder arrangements and gone about it, how do you think that, you know, we can pin down the responsibility on corporations so that multi-stakeholderism just doesn't become like, you know, a way by which, especially in the context of information integrity and the Internet of Trust and the UNESCO process, it just can't be that 
platforms make like you know loose like commitments it can't also be that we just like you know treat it as a national problem for states to regulate transnational platform corporations at the global level how do we build a cat how do we hold like powerful transnational digital platforms responsible for like you know enforcement of human rights and we ensure they don't uh, enjoy impunity like what are some of your thoughts on how can we fix that going forward renata do you have anything to ask i think you should go ahead anna she may be busy Okay, so yeah, the guidelines are very clear about the need for the platform to comply with five key principles. Acknowledging that many regulations, as I mentioned, target the users and not the companies. And I think it is important, you know, I, when I mean the users, is criminalize the users that produce the content and they do not touch the companies at all. So one of the things that we want is to actually make sure that companies are transparent, are accountable, perform due diligence, empower the users uh, uh, through tools and providing tools, and that relates a lot with media and information literacy. And, and I want to come back to that a little bit because actually it's very interesting, this part of the consultation related to media and information literacy. And then, and the fifth is that they align to human rights principles. And the guidelines say that even if it's whatever kind of arrangement, of regulatory arrangement, there should be check and balances and there should be accountability in a meaning that enforcement, that companies need to be subject of enforcement in case that they don't comply with the five principles. They, are, they need to comply with these five principles and any kind of regulation should bear in mind that these five principles should be in the, in the core of any kind of regulation. So um, definitely we, during the in the guidelines, we are clear and we understood from the consultations that the role of civil society, of academia, uh, of media, it's a different role that it is not related. It's is is a role that makes company to uh, be accountable, but the role of the government is also for the for to enforce the ac the accomplishment for the the compliance of the digital platforms. Um, at the same time, the role of the civil society, the media, and the academia is to make governments accountable to make sure that they are not using regulation to go against freedom of expression and access to information, but to actually to identify potential harmful content and to create a, 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 a trustworthy space. Um, so, yeah, that that would be my 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 response. Na thank you, Nadini, and it's great to see Renata. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think from the visits to now, uh, questions about corporate responsibility and accountability have transmutated into very urgent questions about corporate culpability and liability. So I think there is a need to move uh, the vocabulary and then fix it. So on that note, Andriyat, take it away. So <laughs> this is very, very difficult <laughs> because you were so good at breaking it um, that I think fixing it might actually not really be possible. So am I allowed to say that? But <laughs> I'm not actually. Anita I, I, um, uh, asked me to do this. Look, I think that I would agree with everything that the breakers said. Um, but I think, you know, do we have the luxury of, of just breaking and not fixing, and I think we don't. I think, especially not after spending all that money that Hilani was talking about. Some of us flying, by the way, Hilani, not everyone were flown around the world to be part of the GDC consultation. A lot of us had to do it online with like very short sort of cutoff points if you were not a member state. Um, I think we've got to take a step backwards. I think this is what my plea would be to the Tech Invoice Office, to the organizers, the co-facilitators, and the summit of the future. Take a step back and really look at what principles do we already have in this digital space? Um, what norms are there? 
Are they being complied with? If not, why not? We have norms on responsible state behavior, um, the group of governmental expert norms. Those norms are intended to create more trust, more predictability in the relationship between states and the behavior of states. Um, you know, what, what's happening with those norms? They date back, I think, to 2011. Um, let's look at the WISIS principles. Let's take a step back here as well and look at what has worked well from the Geneva uh, Declaration and the, and the WISIS outcome documents. What are the principles in those documents that still hold people together? The notion of people-centered development, for example, of, of ICTs as a driver for, for addressing poverty, for more inclusion. Um, let's look at that as well, and let's you know let's let's look at whether we need a digital compact that's not really about digital, but about people and how people are affected by digitalization, and 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 what the the consequences are of this emerging, evolving um, uh, relationship between society our natural environment and technology. I think there is some of that in the, the, the GDC, and there's some overarching preambular comments, I think, that talk about looking at the big picture. But I think when it comes to the, to the compact and what we are supposed to expect to see in the compact, I'm not sure that that's reflected. I think we need to also take, back, uh, take a step back and look at evidence. Um, I don't see the digital compact, for example, really being informed by the state of digital inequality. It deals with connectivity, it deals with access, you know, in a very, I feel, rather tokenistic way. Maybe if the digital compact can really seriously look at the impact of, of social economic inequality and its manifestation in the form of digital inequality and how that actually undercuts everything that we are trying to do to create a better world through digitalization. And um, when you have, I've just recently been in Nigeria, in the last three months, 140 million Nigerians, this I think is uh, uh, research ICT data, so Alison can speak to that, were not connected to the internet. Many of them actually have an internet connection, but they can't afford um, or they might not have the devices. And yet Nigeria is a country that's investing enormously in digitalization. Um, and where is this investment going? Digital public services. Why invest in digital public services um, if, if you have not yet invested in people actually being able to have access to them? So I think a lot of taking a step back, looking at evidence and prioritizing. I think the GDC could actually benefit from taking one problem that we understand, such as digital inequality, and putting it a, a more granular set of, 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 uh, of targets around that. And then this is another thing I would recommend to fix it, is to, to work in a very complementary way with the, the World Summit on the Information Society and the, the um, Wizards Plus 20 process. Yesterday, Amandeep, uh, was not here yet, I think, but he, he used a really beautiful analogy in the ses session on gender. He talked about how the SDGs, WISIS, and the GDC are like an orchestra that, um, that can all work together and play beautiful music. But orchestras don't always play beautiful music. Orchestras can also, you know, make very sort of not such such quite dissonant music, and, and, and if they don't have a clear manuscript or a conductor. So I think it's a, good meta, it's a good metaphor, but you really have to then work with it. I think the other thing about the, I mean, a lot of you have spoken about the consultation press process, and I think here again, I mean, I think if you're going to look at something like AI governance, you know, it struck me during the GDC process that the Hollywood actors and writers um, and their strike had a clearer take on the challenges of AI than the UN did. Um, and I think maybe that's what happens if you bring workers into the conversation, if you bring the people that are actually organizing um, at, at, at an industry level, um, people that are affected by AI. So I think, again, here, it's a, it's a way of not putting the AI first. It is an important issue. It's absolutely significant that the GDC does address it, but address it in a way that puts people 
um, at the forefront. And then th that will then follow from there that you consult people that are actually working on fair work um, and, and, and um, workers in the gig economy and workers in AI. And I think that's something else I would recommend to fix it, is to, to be more tech neutral. Uh, there's a sense, I think, in which the GDC is responding very much to a narrative that has been created by big IT companies. Um, they create the narrative of the power of tech, but they also create the narrative of the danger of tech. Um, and, and, and the GDC, I think, is very much responding to that. What the GDC should be doing is really responding to the narr narrative of, of inclusion, of equality, of accountability. Um, and of good governance. Now, taking, uh, a, a, you know, looking at those issues and looking at AI in relation to those, very important. But I think it would open up the way in which the GDC at the moment is looking um, at, at AI, which is in fact an application of technological innovation that has been with us for a very long time. When it comes to the multi-stakeholder participation, I think as well the uh, there's emphasis on that, but I would I would think that the GDC could really learn here from the work of CSDD, the ITU, the WSIS process, and, and many of us at national level, that you have to be actually more inclusive. You're never going to have effective conversations about climate change and, 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 and technology if you're not actually working with the environmental sector and environmental rights defenders, both from the level of people that are at community level um, defending forests from being destroyed by miners or illegal farming to people that are doing advocacy and analysis at a global level. So I think there is an opportunity here where the GDC, because it's new, because it's fresh, and it's not... Uh, emerging from a internet governance process, but from a sort of broader governance process, it could actually open up um, stakeholder participation to make it more granular, both at the community-based level, but also at the, at the advocacy level. Similarly, with issues of trade, of financing, of indebtedness. These are all issues that impact on um, digital public infrastructure, for example, on the capacity of states to invest in infrastructure um, that can be resilient, um, that, that enable um, inclusion. So here again, I think if the GDC can open up who it talks to and who it talks to uh, about what. I was saying to Anita, when I prepared for this, I've been looking at debt in Africa. Currently, African countries are spending on average more on debt servicing than on public health. Um, now, if that's the status quo, how are those governments ever going to be able to actually effectively invest in inclusive digital public infrastructure and addressing digital inequality? So uh, if we don't address the cycles of indebtedness in, and, and the way in which the global financial um, system operates at the moment, we're not going to see any change. And, and what happens at the GDC level will float on top. So I think that's another fix it, you know. Actually drill down, look at what we want to get out of the GDC, but look at it from an ecosystem uh, perspective. What do we need to do in terms of the public sector, governments having the capacity and the resources? to effectively implement? What do we need at the level of civil society, being able to effectively hold governments accountable? What do we need at the level of changing how we regulate corporations? Market regulation that creates more market entrance as well. So I think there's a granularity there that is absolutely missing. And I think if we don't have that, we <coughs> might be able to get consensus, but but will we get value? I think that's the, the, the thing. And I, I, mean, I think that's actually probably where I will end. I think, um, Anita and, and everyone, I would say that let's, you know, we have an imperfect system in the, the World Summit on the Information Society follow-up and implementation, but it actually has, it's grounded in many respects. We have the work that CSDD has been doing and UNCTAD has been doing on the digital economy. There's actually really good data there on how small and medium enterprises, for example, are either enabled or disabled by how digital markets are regulated. We have data from human rights organizations and from UNESCO um, on the impact on women journalists, 
for example, of, of certain, certain uh, online practices. We know, as Ilani had said, that dis and misinformation legislation is silencing dissent and freedom of expression. Um, we also know that community voices are not effectively included in, in many countries when it comes to addressing um, community-centered connectivity. You know, and we also know that, that current business models are not succeeding in terms of the access market. We know that the mobile operators have reached a kind of a, a ceiling in terms of extending access. So what I'd like to see with the GDC is really just using the summit of the, in the future, using the resources of the UN and the broader community um, um, to, to, to work with this data. I think, I, and this will be my last point, I think, Dennis, your data is very interesting because I think that's why it's, I think, such an opportunity for the GZ GDC to fix its approach to multi-stakeholder participation by not using it as a brand, by not reducing it to being tripartite, but actually opening it up completely and bringing in the technical community. It's interesting, you're, because I do think there's a tendency sometimes to think of the technical community as being aligned with the corporate sector. Sometimes it is, but often it is not. And I think absolutely we cannot do um, um, digital governance effectively without bringing the technical community into the table, not just as part of civil society or, or government or um, business, but as a stakeholder um, in their own right. And that applies to the research and academic community as well. Thanks, Andriet. I think the more I think about it while prioritizing is so important, but we also know that so much of our future is tied to the digital uh, and the choices we make and the tragedy we do now might really have cascading impacts. So that's another paradox, um, you know, of in the context of uh, digital inequality paradoxes, how do we actually address the policy paradox? And I think um, uh, that's uh, quite important. I wanted to propose a small change in the order of speakers. Uh, Nan Sutisom, who is from Engage Media, is re replacing Rishab Bailey, who was going to speak to us. Um, uh, and uh, Rishab is unable to join us. And therefore, Nan, uh, just in about 24 hours, has kindly uh, you know, offered to come on board. And uh, what I wanted to suggest is she has uh, what she says is a very well-defined and bounded agenda to talk about. And therefore, what I want to do is um, she wants to flag issues about digital trade. So I just wanted to request you, Nan, to come in and speak to how the connections between trade and digital rights play out and um, if you think they are fixable at all. So over to you, Nan. Thank you so much, Anita. Um, uh, let me... Uh, well, so to share the screen. Um, hello, everyone. You can see my screen, yes? Yes, and we can hear you. Perfect. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Nan. I'm a digital rights project coordinator at Engage Media. We're a digital rights uh, advocacy group in South and uh, Southeast Asia. I'm here uh, as part uh, of the Digital Trade Alliance. So uh, I want to speak to you briefly about uh, using this um, trade agreement, uh, namely Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity, or IPEF. I like to use this as a uh, concrete use case to illustrate how corporate interest captures the internet governance space. And not only that, the IPEF um, also highlights the geopolitical aspects that come into the dynamics and how this plays out. This FDA in particular is understood as a reactionary attempt by the U.S. to balance another FTA, uh, namely the RCEP, that is dominated by the Chinese government influence. Um, the IPEF in involves uh, 14 countries, the U.S., India, uh, some countries in Oceania, uh, most of Southeast Asia, and uh, including Japan and East Asia's countries as well. Um, but uh, as such, the U.S. government chairs all chapters of the ne negotiations and controls the text uh, of the IPEF. Um, this is expected to conclude by November um, 2023. Now, unlike other FTAs, the IPEF will not only offer market access um, and, and GSP privileges, so the signatories 
namely the Global South, um, will not receive the trade benefits that uh, other FDA may offer. Um, the text the digital trade chapter is also not available, making it difficult for uh, nonprofit organizations and other stakeholders to participate in the process. So quickly extrapolate this FTA, it's first important to note that the US-Mexico-Canada FTA uh, or USMCA is explicitly cited as the baseline, as the baseline for the commitments in the IPEF. And why is that important is because um, the USMCA is widely regarded as a pro big tech agreement. Um, and what we have observed uh, in the USMCA is that corporate interests are very well captured in particular big tech um, in terms of digital trade. Similarly, in IPEF, 69% of US trade advisors represent large corporations and their trade associations. And this agreement is commonly seen as favorable in the interest of big tech um, with the US trade reps uh, themselves uh, who have solicited advice from big tech and on digital trade provisions. Some of the alarming issues uh, include, and I'll go very quickly on this is, um, if uh, like the USMCA, um, IPEF uh, will, will have enforceable cross-border uh, data flow uh, requirements, domestic measures aim at enhancing privacy and security of data, as well as uh, measures providing for regulatory access to data could therefore be affected by this uh, provision, such as that in uh, Thailand, where I'm from, the Personal Data Protection Act in 2022, which was modeled after the EU's uh, GDPR. So it has multiple, a few uh, implications. Uh, first, it makes it difficult to introduce any domestic measures to restrict uh, cross-border uh, data transfers. And while there may be exceptions to this uh, in the in the agreement, there are very narrow in scope uh, of necessity and proportionality requirements, which are very high bars to meet. Um, in the ultimate analysis, such provision could help data flow to um, countries with weaker data protection standards or accountability uh, mechanism. Another issue is uh, that it will aim to establish safeguards against a uh, forced source code uh, disclosure as a condition of market access. So it will aim to establish um, a safeguard against uh, any uh, algorithm disclosure in particular. Many countries in the global south right now are uh, developing regulatory responses to the use of algorithm and, and or AI. And one tool of regulation is ensuring uh, transparency and accountability over how algorithms and software um, in general work. Um, and with the safeguard, if this comes into play, it will restrict various tools available to um, a state to promote competition, fairness in the digital economy. Preventing such disclosure in the future may lead to um, also algorithmic discrimination in areas like employment policies, insurance policies, or uh, search engine rankings, which will have the effect on the competitiveness of smaller businesses in the global south. Um, now, uh, I'm sure everyone in the room are, are aware of the dangers of AI. Um, so this lack of transparency in source code disclosure and algorithm will limit the ability for independent and ex ante verification of how a software product works, which can be essential to uh, limiting the risk arising from the use of software and the black box uh, problem with AI. Sec secrecy of algorithm also goes against the developing regulatory consensus on the use of AI tools. For example, the OECD's AI policy uh, observatory, as well as a number of proposed laws that seek to ensure pre-deployment verification of software and AI. Um, now, to capture it all, uh, the um, codification of the USMCA, um, if had, if it will be adopted in future trade ag agreement. Uh, for number one, the free flow of data cost will limit the ability for countries to implement localization norms. The inclusion of this clause would allow for continued flow of data to the global north, where it would be subjected to its um, relatively lower or freer standard um, uh, data protection and accountability mechanism. 
provisions restricting uh, access to source, co source code and algorithm will also limit the ability of regulators and independent uh, entity to scrutinize software products prior to their uh, deployment. So uh, in particular, when the Global South are right now in the process of developing regulatory frameworks concerning AI, um, this restriction will seek to preemptively um, limit the ability for states and regulators to implement public interest or consumer interest regulation in the digital space. So ultimately, codification um, like this will limit the regulatory options available um, to uh, the signatory countries in the future to implement, to implement um, regulations over the digital ecosystem. Now, in the spirit of fix it. I'm not sure if my uh, presentation fit into this, but uh, first and foremost, I, I think that the GDC uh, mechanism should aim to promote regulating uh, data and technology in uh, public interest, realizing that digital commons as a global public good and aiming to establish international security standards and cross compliance recognition frameworks of design testing and certification to ensure the safety, reliability and trust of critical infrastructure um, and improved security around digital uh, technologies. This includes, but not limited to, uh, for example, uh, privacy protections and grievance uh, re redress mechanism. Uh, FTA negotiations should also aim for an agreement on how to define different types of data, which can then be used to create rules on data governance. Um, in addition, um, there's also another issue with labor rights, with the integration of algorithm in digital labor um, and gig economy, ensuring um, uh, the GDC should uh, aim to ensure that workers in digital industries are protected and have access to fair employment conditions, including issues related uh, to gig workers and the right to organize. That should be uh, the top priority. And last but not least, uh, fair taxation on uh, global companies. Um, so ensuring that um, the so-called big tech uh, pay their fair share of taxes in countries where they operate, uh, which can contribute to funding uh, essential public services and digital infrastructure in the global south. Mechanism to um, amplify nonprofit and stakeholder voices should also be at the forefront of our digital trade agreement. The IPAF has a stakeholder uh, listening session, which is a mechanism for uh, CSO to participate, but um, it's not as meaningful as you'd like, the, you'd like it to be because negotiations is um, secretive. And so uh, we just end up with um, civil society actors uh, listening to each other in the room. So um, with that option, uh, we, we have to uh, address how we can make um, this more meaningful uh, contribution and engagement so that uh, digital trade agreements can be more responsible. And um, yeah, as the USMCA codification uh, will likely become a trajectory in digital trade, um, it calls for robust mobilization to push back against the interest of big tech and ensure consumer and user interests can be protected um, as well as their rights. Um, and I'd like to end my uh, presentation here with the report by our colleague Ritab on understanding the IPEF and uh, its intersection with um, internet governance. So that's about it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for Over stepping in now. you. Yes. Um, I just wanted to say that it's only getting more complicated. So for the last voices, I think, we count on your power, uh, but we also remember Shamika's, uh, you know, call to not give up and you know continue the good struggle. I think one important thing that comes out of Nan's, uh, you know, articulation is that it's not just the narrative around the GDC, but sometimes I think where the narrative lies is not where the politics lies. So maybe we will go away feeling happy that everyone was equally unhappy with the GDC, but the trade wars will be fought differently at a different place. So, you know, the whole questions around localization, public interest, source code, opacity, and the exploitation of the commons for extractivism will remain. And therefore, then the question arises as to, you know, without letting forum shopping by the powerful, how do you ensure coherence in the, you know, multilateral system? You know, that question always existed, but I think that's sharper. So, 
Uh, don't go away, everybody. We have the smartest voices in the room, the penultimate and ultimate. So over to you, Emma, Global Coordinator of uh, the Alliance for Universal Digital Rights for Equality now. Thank you so much. Oh, um, you're right, the, the complexity of this issue is um, increasing, isn't it, as we go on with the session. And I definitely don't have the whole solution to fixing the GDC, but I have got part of the solution. And at the Alliance for Universal Digital Rights, or Audrey, we've been considering your central question um, of how to come up with a set of principles that guide our digital future so that it ensures justice for the majority world. And this time last year at IGF, we launched uh, our nine principles, uh, securing um, our human rights in our digital world. Um, and since then, we've really been building on that, um, working with a really wide range of organizations from all over the world, including in the global majority. Um, and what our partial solution is that um, the GDC has to be feminist um, if it's going to work. And feminism benefits everybody. And yesterday, we launched a new set of principles. There seem to be a lot of principles around, but there are only 10. Um, these are feminist principles for the Global Digital Compact. And we launched these with over 50 um, other CSOs, mainly from the global majority, um, in partnership with organizations like APC, Derechos Digitales, Digital Rights Foundation in Pakistan, Policy um, in Uganda, and also two U um, UN agencies. Um, and we launched it to an audience of member states, including the US, Chile, Finland, um, Germany, um, Iceland, who all talked about the need for a feminist approach to, um, to global internet governance. Um, and so I thought it might just be helpful today if I talked to you through very briefly through the main headlines of our 10 principles. Um, and the basic premise is that if the core principles for the global digital compact um, of openness, freedom and security are going to be met, then they need to be infused with an intersectional feminist perspective to ensure that the ongoing digital transformation of our economies and societies can usher in a gender just world. So principle number one is that any digital future must be grounded in existing human rights law. Many people have said that already, including um, Professor um, Ambassador Gill, um, and also rooted in an intersectional approach which promotes the rights of women and girls in all their diversity, plus people facing multiple and intersectional forms of discrimination, because we don't want digital technology to widen the um, equality divide. Um, the second principle um, is that um, the agreement must guarantee freedom from technology facilitated gender based violence, which there is an academic of at the moment, and it's stopping many women and people from diverse genders and sexualities from taking part in society, and it's undermining our democracy. Um, our third principle is around promoting the rights to freedom of expression, privacy and um, peaceful assembly, which the UNESCO um, have been talking about as well. This includes the right to encryption and online anonymity and the, prohibit the prohibition of internet disruptions that don't comply with human rights law. Um, the fourth principle is about ensuring universal, affordable, accessible and safe internet access for all, which many people have talked about. And this includes something that um, one of our speakers earlier talked about was um, creating and sharing content in your own language, um, which is really important. Um, the fifth um, principle is around demanding strict action against harmful surveillance applications and high risk um, AI systems. Um, and number six is about expanding women's participation and leadership in the tech sector and in digital policy making. So if we want this new tech to actually work for us and make our lives better, we need to be in the driving seat. Um, and that means that women in all of their diversity need to be involved in the design of new technology, um, leading tech companies, but also being involved in decision making at national and international levels on governance, regulation and technology 
technology development. And obviously this is going to include supporting more women and girls um, into STEM subjects, but it will also require more involvement of women in democratic processes. So number seven is around um, prioritising strategies that reduce the environmental impact of new technology. I was really pleased to hear uh, Henriette talking about the need to involve environmental organisations in this process. We know that the impacts of climate change are not felt equally around the world. Um, women in developing countries are most likely be to be disproportionately affected. And machine learning is incredibly energy intensive. Um, there's also going to be a greater um, impact on water use. Um, so um, AI's contribution to climate change could be very significant in the future and states are going to have to be much more proactive in setting limits on how much carbon new technology can produce and also minimise the harm from the extraction of natural resources to fuel this new technology, which again falls disproportionately on a small number of nations, often on indigenous land and in countries that are recovering from a history of being colonised. So I'm almost there, I'm on number eight now, which is implement measures for states and transnational corporations to ensure data privacy uh, and governance and consent. So the protection of people's de personal data is the bedrock of a lot of these other principles, as has been mentioned by other speakers. And many states don't yet have um, privacy and data protection laws and measures to stop transnational companies from exploiting our data are not in place has also been talked about already. So number nine, the ninth principle is around adopting equality by design principles um, and a human rights based approach through all phases of digital technology development. Um, so algorithms that make decisions about us are discriminating against us every day um, with no accountability for the harm caused. And I was really concerned um, by our um, previous speaker talking about how some trade agreements are actually going to make this situation worse because they won't provide the transparency of the algorithms that we need, um, which is why we need um, a human rights-based approach and equality by design principles baked into the development of algorithmic decision-making systems and um, prior to deployment. This means things like gender rights impact assessments, um, which brings me to the final principle, which is around setting AI safeguards to prevent discriminatory biases. Um, safeguards um, must be put in place to make sure that gender stereotyping and discriminatory biases are not translated into AI systems. And these standards need to be developed in consultation with those who are being harmed already. So you need to talk to us. And at a minimum, we need transparency in relation of data sets, their sources and uses, and how that data is being applied in algorithms. So that's it, really. It's not the whole solution, but we think it's a really important part of fixing the global digital compact. We were so pleased to hear some of the governments we um, at our launch event yesterday um, talk about, agree with us about the importance of a feminist approach. And of course, some countries have already got feminist foreign policies, which really help with this. So if we can set all of this, get all of this into the global digital compact, it stands a chance of making the GDC a powerful tool for democratic global digital governance. Thank you. Thanks so much, Emma. Um, I also feel that from your presentation and Ali's, there's this uh, need to invert the question sometimes and say, in all the talk about digital public infrastructures, uh, you know, what about the quasi-publics that are controlled by the private? So why aren't we asking them to, you know, open up and make their data sets public? You know, questions like these, which are, you know, hidden in the narrative that are often sold to us. Uh, Luca is here. He's extremely jet-lagged. And therefore, we hope that the stream of consciousness from him will fix it. Thank you very much, Anita. I'm also aware that I'm the only thing that stands between us and dinner. <laughs> and at the same time, the last speaker after two hour and a half of uh, being here. So I will try to be provocative so that people can wake up a little bit. Uh, my name is Luca Belli, I'm Professor of Digital Governance and Regulation at FGV Law School. So what I'm going to say is very much informed uh, on the research and thinking on how digital governance mechanisms work and how can they work effectively or not, and how regulatory framework 
work and how they can work effectively or not. Uh, also, uh, full disclosure, over the past year, I've been uh, building for five years a project called uh, Cyber Bricks, where we analyze the digital policies of the BRICS countries. So a lot of what also I'm going to say is based on how also these very large uh, emerging economies have tackled some of these issues. I have three uh, structural challenges that we have to, to face and three potential remedies that we could use, but I'm not sure we will use. Uh, let's start with the structural challenges. The first one is that, and I'm also building, especially in what uh, um, Alison and, and Elani were saying, because there were some good comments there that I want to expand. Uh, first, uh, structural challenge. We have, an in, when you analyze digital governance, which is what the, the kind of framework that the Global Digital Compact aims at addressing, you know very well that it's extremely fragmented, not only geographically, which is something we have stressed, but also thematically. And that is an enormous stru structural challenge because you only have regulators that deal with competition and speak on only amongst them. You have regulators that deal with telecommunications and speak only amongst them. You have regulators that speaks about data, not in all countries, and deal only amongst them. We, you don't have platform regulators. You don't have AI regulators, although all regulators want to be some of them. Uh, now, this means that it's extraordinarily difficult, inherently almost impossible to have a, a strategy that is uh, holistic and that can work in practice because you, have, you face this enormous thematic fragmentation. In even if you have a very good strategy, then you have the second structural challenge. That is, you might have extraordinarily uh, relevant political and economic interests that will play against your strategy. And this has already been raised, but let me stress that uh, there has been, over the past, over the pandemic period, enormous, almost in, uh, indecent profits from six, five or six corporations. And uh, no one has ever taxed that profit. No one. W because there is only one country that doesn't want it to be taxed. And that is an enormous political and economic interest that you have to face. And I will come back to this towards the end. Uh, if you have to regulate AI, and everyone agrees that AI re has to regulate, there is even one specific CEO that uh, does road shows in Latin America pontificating about how uh, we need international regulation on AI. Uh, but then at the same time, you, when you are like, then we will regulate based on risk and we will limit your profit, they are, no, we do not want AI regulation. There is, you may be all aware of the fact that there is it, a, an ongoing effort of the Council of Europe to do a treaty on AI, but uh, the US have already made it very explicit that it will only, for them, will only apply for the public sector. Well, if AI is developed by the private sector, that, <laughs> that specific treaty is not even worth the paper is written on. And I'm sorry to be so blunt, but I think maybe at some time here we start to wake up a little bit. Uh, the third structural uh, challenge is the fact that systemically, it's, uh, I, 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 I don't think I've used the best possible term before when I made my question asking about bad faith actor, because it's not bad faith. Uh, most uh, of the multinational corporations are publicly traded corporations. This means that they have the, the executive have a legal obligation, a fiduciary obligation, to prefer the shareholder interest to anything else that is not binding by law. So there, it is simply impo it is not it is naive to think that uh, large multinational corporations will privilege human rights to pr shareholder profits because every three months and every quarter they have to meet shareholders and tell them we have increased costs, we have re sorry, we have reduced costs, we have increased benefits. Actually, it's very interesting also that, uh, that, that what happened after the pandemic or after this enormous in the indecent profits has been <laughs> not redistribution of the profits, but firing of at least 10% of the workforce because shareholders were annoyed because that very enormous profits could not be kept, and so costs had to be reduced, and so tech corporations have started firing people, right? So this is, uh, that is a systemic challenge that we have because those who, are, who have the power to decide have not only an a market incentive, 
a fiduciary obligation to increase benefits and decrease costs. And here we enter into the possible. Uh, well, there is also a very good study that I wanted to mention by uh, Suba, Ulla, and colleagues on multinational corporations and human rights violations in, the, in emerging economies, because they map uh, more or less 200 uh, um, corporations that have subscribed to the global compact, not the digital one, the global compact, showing that 90% of them engage in human rights violation. And have, even if they have sp explicit commitment to the global compact, because they have a, they have a duty to do so. If, they ha if, they, if they, their shareholder want to be pleased, they have to increase profit, right? So that is something, I'm not, I have nothing against this, uh, specific th these specific corporations, but that is something that one has to be considered to be, to be pragmatic and to find solutions. So first, how to tackle the lack of systemic approach? I think that we have we start to see the only uh, let's say document that gives us an idea of what is happening with the uh, global digital compass is this brief, this policy brief that was released in May. And you, I think it's, they, they make a good effort at doing a, an initial systemic approach, mapping the principles, mapping the potential uh, actions, and mapping what fora already exist. But that is very embryonic approach and needs to be complemented also which kind of good practices you have to use to implement those actions and to implement those principles. And this is non-existing so far. I hope it will come with the, with the uh, uh, following phases of the uh, global digital global compact actually here my second point of suggestion is to actually s learn from the igf as a good platform for suggesting uh, solutions actually what <laughs> nobody seems to remember is that the mandate of the igf is also to recommend things so the, if you take the tunis agenda paragraph 72 72g it's explicitly sa stated that the igf should recommend uh, issues uh, to the global stakeholders, and this has never been done because think, people think that recommending means imposing. Re recom identifying good practices and recommending them doesn't mean that the IGF should say all the government of the world must follow this example. Simply means that IGF or any other people, person, entity that recommends something is saying this exists, you should consider it. A lot of people travel to fancy places every year to discuss solutions and maybe to recommend them. So try start mapping them and proposing them as potential solutions. This is nothing. There is nothing controversial in it. Last but not least, uh, if we want to have a digital global compact that is meaningful, we really have to focus on implementation. This not only that does not only means suggesting good practices that should be followed but also the metrics that should be used to, analy to analyze if they succeed or not. And something that if you study China and if you study big tech, you start to, to understand they do in pretty much the same way, is understanding which kind of facilitators and obstacles exist. Because that is the greatest point if you want, the greatest difficulty or advantage if you want to implement something, knowing what will go wrong and try to address it, and knowing who will, could be helpful and trying to, ad to address it. That is actually something that, paradoxically, we can learn from big tech, uh, because uh, <laughs> sometimes that, is, that has become a joke, sometimes a sad joke with friends. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not sure which list is longer. If the list of uh, potentially disruptive new businesses that have been acquired by uh, big tech of the list of brilliant friends working in academia or civil society that had been hired <laughs> by big tech. But at some point, you have to understand that if you have to implement a medium or long-term strategy, you have to identify what are the obstacles and what are the facilitators. And I, m I was a little bit frustrated, I, I have to confess today, when I asked Amandeep today if they had a plan for it, because the, 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 the answer that the good, the good faith actor have to do more, I'm not sure if it is the most effective to uh, achieve a, an effective uh, global digital compact. I hope I've been enough provocative, but I see people sleeping, so I'm not sure. No, I've no, we are, we are. So we just want to wear the politically correct face at the in the IGF, that's all. So um, thank you so much to everybody. I just want to take like, since we have 15 minutes to go before the room, uh, you know, is closed and shut. I just wanted to know if there are people in the room who have thoughts uh, to fix it, to build it anyway. 
And I know that Renata wanted to make a point. Uh, so maybe we can start with Renata. And in the meanwhile, uh, I can bring the, the microphone to anyone that wants to contribute. Anita, sorry, may, may I just add? Uh, add Absolutely. Uh, 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 something that I, 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 was f I forgot to mention is that as I'm sure that these five or six uh, multi multinational corpora global corporations that have uh, earned these very hefty profits on the, on the pandemic <laughs> are extremely, extremely committed to the global digital compacts. Something one may ask them is to make a voluntary contribution or uh, of, let's say, 30% of their billions that they have earned because people were obliged to use their, their services for two years to finance all the th nice things that we have uh, said or the nice ideas we can have. And that does not require taxation by anyone. And as they are fully committed to the global digital combat, I'm sure they will accept. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Um, uh, Renata, just a second, Ho uh, or maybe I'll just call upon Renata, is that okay? Uh, okay, uh, Renata, just hold on. This is somebody who is online, sir. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it, it, the reason why I asked to speak is because I have to leave very quickly. Um, my name is Kleva Gatete, and I'm here, I'm from Rwanda, I'm the PR for uh, uh, the UN. I'm one of the co-facilitators together with the, my colleague here from Sweden. Uh, we came here specifically to listen to you. And uh, one of the things which you have to make clear is that there is no digital compact now. We are just compiling all the ideas so that there is an intergovernmental discussion and later on we we'll come up with a global digital compact. We have had consultations widely. We have had so many uh, deep dives in every of the eight areas and we've had from different people, we had even special sessions for the civil society itself. The reason why we came here is, at the end of the day, nobody's happy with you know, maybe what is going on. And that's why we came here to say, can you narrow it down so that we see the issues and the ones which you think should be part of the compact or which can contribute the compact. So they are given to us because next year in January, we are going to come and sit down together with everybody to make sure that we can use these kind of ideas that you've given us as part of the discussion with the member states. The B193 member states discussing, but given what you have, have compiled already too much, but you came here specifically for the IGA, for the people who are participating, and especially for your team, for you to narrow down and give us something in writing so that all your ideas and what you think that is very, very important. The reason is because technology f affects everyone. It affects the way of life. It doesn't affect one or the other, it affects all of us. Whether in education, whether you are in whatever business you are doing, it affects all of us. And we want to hear from everyone. But we want to make sure that we do it in an organized manner, in a way that you can bring your ideas, put them together and say, this is our position, which you think can contribute to your discussion so that we take them into account, and that to be more professional in terms of doing things. Because uh, we would be unhappy with some of the things, but if we don't do it right, then you find we don't have a way of discussing it with our colleagues who are not here, who didn't listen to you. And it's very, very important for, for us to be able to capture exactly what you think that can be included. And that's why we are here listening. Actually, we want it to be at the back, so that you can listen and take notes. Uh, but I think I... I thought it was very important for, for us to tell you that uh, if we put something in writing, it would be help, helpful for us because it would help our case to argue and to be able to convince uh, people. So we heard what you said, but if you can help us, I think that would be useful. Thank you so much. Very grateful to you for giving us an opportunity to submit this in writing. Maybe the three-hour discussions, we will be able to generate a report as Andrea had suggested in the morning as well. And we'd be happy to share that with you. And uh, if uh, your uh, co-chair from Sweden wants to speak, ma'am, would you like? Yes. Thank you very much for being here with us. Uh, so, Renata, you go, and uh, after that, Andriet and uh, Alison. Is very quick and specific point on the funding. If we achieve one thing as a civil society, will will be that this digital uh, global digital compact is. Um, formed together with f a fund uh, with uh, mandatory contributions from the richest countries in the world, 
and from the richest companies voluntary because we have we have no legal mechanisms to make that happen to be mandatory. But I think that if if we if we otherwise we will waste a long process that will on, only end in principles that then will not be applied because of lack of resources. So if we can do one thing united, you know, like the the poorest countries in the world and the civil societies to work together. Uh, for the uh, summit of the future to be like, you know, the big announcement, the big headline after this effort is that su substantial money is committed to increase the capacities, to increase the ability and to make the, um, uh, not only worse, but worse transform into actions and into proper uh, public digital infrastructure localized in the countries that need it the most. So to fix it, include a fin uh, financing mechanism to make all of these nice words be translated into actions. Thanks so much, Renata. Andrea. Thanks very much, Anita. I mean, uh, what I wanted to say, it's partly in response to what Luca was saying about the original mandate of the IGF was to facilitate, well, inter-institutional that's, I think, one of the very important aspects of it, and also recommendations. And I think one of the, the reasons that we are not doing well enough in this IGF space and in what we have at the moment is our multi so-called multi-stakeholder ecosystem is that we don't have certainty. Um, it's very unpredictable. I think uh, that, you know, so this is something else I think that the GDC can do is to take away that element of... Will the IGF continue or will it not continue? Obviously, that is a decision of, of, of the WSIS plus 20 process. But if we're going to strengthen these processes, make them more relevant and more inclusive, we need to be able to know that they're not being used as political footballs by member states or UN agencies or internal you know, territorial issues within the UN system. These, these processes are not as strong as they should be. They're not as inclusive as they should be, but they are the best that we have. And I think I really facilitate, you know, in the, in the recent letter from the co-facilitators, I got the message that in a sense we are getting that because it will take years of evolving and continuing to strengthen these spaces. And I think the one thing as civil society that we have to be careful of is well is to to set our own terms i think the gdc consultation processes required us to respond to what was given to us i think we possibly did not do enough to fill the gaps the igf mag as well for two years it created its thematic structure based on what was given to it by the gdc process or the digital cooperation process that's good it wants to be relevant but in that process you could actually be missing exactly the same things that this other top-down process is missing. Like, ta like taxation. Thank you, Anita. Thank you, first of all, uh, very much for inviting us to this very informative uh, session. I've heard a lot of uh, very uh, interesting, insightful, uh, and also useful comments. I think uh, um, some of the points may be also good uh, for us to take into account in the WISIS Plus 20 review. Um, I, I forgot to introduce myself. Actually, I'm working uh, for Shemika. Shemika is our director. So we are servicing the UN Commission on Science, Technology, and for Development. And CSD, uh, in short, is conducting a WISIS Plus 20 uh, review in order to provide inputs to the General Assembly, who's uh, which is going to conduct uh, the WISIS review uh, plus 20 review in 2025. Uh, so um, I would like to uh, also invite this group to participate in the WISIS plus 20 review because some of your um, points are very relevant to WISIS plus 20. As uh, several speakers have mentioned, we also need to look at uh, uh, what are there now uh, in this world, uh, whether they are working, why they are not working, and how we can do to make them uh, uh, work better uh, so that we can really uh, achieve uh, the um, with this uh, vision of uh, uh, inclusive, uh, um, people-centered, and uh, development-oriented information society. And the CSD is going to uh, launch its uh, open consultation, which is multi-stakeholder consultation, on the 10th of October in this uh, house uh, on in room E from 3.15 to uh, 4.45. 
at the same time, we have also uh, circulated uh, a questionnaire together with other key uh, actors, uh, UNESCO, ITU, and UNDP. We also invite you to uh, fill out the questionnaire. It's available on the IGF uh, website, the questionnaire, and they will be taken into account uh, in preparing our report. And the report is going to be discussed at uh, two annual sessions of the CSED. One is next year, April 27th CSED, the other is uh, uh, in 2025. And then after these two uh, discussions at CSD, we are going to present a report to the General Assembly in 2025 for its review. So I really encourage this group to participate in the CSD's Research Plus 20 review because you have offered very insightful uh, comments and, and points and messages that we can definitely consider in our Research Plus 20 review. Thank you again. Yes, good day. My name is Nigel Kasimir. I'm from the Caribbean Telecommunications Union, which is a, an intergovernmental organization. Um, I did come in late, so I'm not sure if this specific comment was made before, but in um, hearing the gentleman's comments earlier about the structural shortcoming with regulation, um, I am aware that the ITU has a fledgling attempt at regulatory collaboration, which they are calling the Digital Regulation Network, which they launched at the Global Symposium for Regulators in May this year. So that um, is probably something that could also be taken into account. Thank you. Um, Anita, I, I did say when I speak about the, the first phase, the build it, that we'd um, <laughs> just want to say something about the fix it, because I think that's really what <laughs> we're, some of the issues that we raised in the beginning um, really and, and, and were raised in the fix it session are really still, we, we can, we're still not addressing what fundamentally has to be done. We're still dealing with some of the problems and, and, and maybe not sufficiently what the solutions are. So, I mean, just in response to the you know, constant reference about using what we've got and, and you know, how relevant WISA still remains in terms of how relevant um, IGF remains. I think these are important continuities. They can't, they, they're significant still because we still have the same problems. And so I think it's really important in referencing those that we commit ourselves to doing something differently. We're we continuing to identify the same problems and speak about the same kind of... Um, you know, <laughs> neoliberal market reforms and the dominance of certain sectors, the assumptions that the best value creation is out of, you know, a private sector create value, create these kinds of things. So I, I think we really, if we, if, you know, when, when the ambassador um, Gill speaks about, you know, this needs to be a paradigm shift. Um, the paradigm shift is not an institutional changing of the deck chairs, you know, and institutional arrangements, we have to do something far more fundamental. And I think the problem is that, you know, we, what are our rationales for governance? We're continuing to use the rationales for governance that were around, you know, traditional commercial supply side regulation of resources in the allocation of, you know, in the allocation of our, 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 our resources. And we need to really challenge that. We need to start looking at the demand side um, value that we need in our resource allocation. If we're serious about building public value, if we're serious about you know, economic justice, then we've got to be looking at those. That is how we get to a commons, not about carving out a little bit of space that the commercial sector doesn't want you know, for a little bit of Wi-Fi or something. We need some, you know, really to address those fundamental issues. So yes, there are structural issues at the governance level, that um, um, Luke has very um, you know, eloquently addressed. But they're actually, we're still not dealing with the structural inequalities that we've got that, are, that make all this digital inequality manifest. And I think that if the, GD, if the Global Digital Compact wants to make a, a significant paradigm shift, that is where the paradigm shift needs to come, is in the rationale for global governance and regulation. Anyone else? Yes. Th thank you. Uh, thank you for your uh, informative discussion and comments. And uh, I'm Yuichiro Abe, uh, a Japanese, uh, randomly uh, participating in this uh, workshop. But I have, uh, I, 
after listening to the uh, fruitful discussion, I realized that the process, the fixing the process of the GDC uh, is quite important uh, because uh, we have the expression in Japanese that uh, this is just a rice cake in a painted in a picture. We, uh, we cannot eat it uh, even if it looks delicious. So we have to make it uh, by pro uh, through a uh, uh, real process. And I, I, I have one question. So maybe uh, the GDC should be like an orchestra with a mu be beautiful music, but we need a, a conductor. And who should be conductor in this process? Maybe it will be a target of a political battle uh, or like that, but or it, it is very difficult. But I would like to hear the recommendation from IGF about the who should be, who should play the conductor, and not m maybe only one, but who uh, who should be the several conductor for the process. So this will need, I think, an entirely another, you know, zero day event. So <laughs> it's an institutional question. And as Alison said, you know, it's only partly institutional. We also have a name for the report, not just a little bit of Wi-Fi. <laughs> so uh, yes, also, yeah, not, not, yeah, we want real rice cakes, yeah. So I mean, um, Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, also this. So just to say thank you to everybody who helped uh, co-construct this, uh, the dynamic coalitions that were involved. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Luca. Also, the Global Digital Justice Forum. Um, and to all of you uh, who so readily gave of your time and uh, sat here and came back after your other commitments. And to our surprise visitors, the co-chairs uh, of the GDC. I just wanted to also say that uh, the thing that struck me when I read uh, Amartya Sen's The Idea of Justice was that never, never should you make the mistake of going behind the idea of justice. You must understand the idea of injustice. And then you have done your job. You know? So in, in some sense, I think this session was very instructive because all of us contributed to co-creating uh, the pool of ideas of what we don't want. And I think for long, uh, the wise um, you know, people of the world have told us you know, what is necessary to fix? It's not rocket science at all. We know it, and we know the political economy of, uh, you know, anti-solutions uh, in the right way. So I think uh, we should build public value, and we should probably uh, go to the report in the next stage. Uh, so I'd like to request all of you, and maybe I can reach out, and if uh, you would like to, please send back your uh, comments. Uh, that would really help. And uh, the IGF does a marvelous job of the closed captioning. But they, it may not always be accurate, so it would be nice to have your comments. Uh, so thanks to everybody, and a round of applause. Yeah.